Welcome to Moss Marketing Monday, a.k.a. the M3 Podcast. Brought to you by Moss Marketing Group. Bringing you everything marketing every Monday. Stay tuned for marketing tips and tricks you can use today. The M3 Podcast, marketing knowledge to help you succeed. Let's get started. Welcome back to the M3 Podcast. We still need to fix that intro. That's it's coming soon. But <laughs> that was cool, it, though. Yeah, it's hyped. It just doesn't really tell you what the podcast is about anymore. <laughs> it used to be pretty heavy about marketing. Now it's all just everything that happens. No longer <laughs> Moss Marketing Mondays. We got a whole tight on that, but we, we'll just throw other shit in the intro. Yeah. But this week, we got Reiki on from the MMG crew. We got Ryan and we got Tyler. And Tyler, we were actually talking before this, is I should have got Trophy made because he has now hit a podcast in the basement in the original M3 studio. He got in the office in the M3 podcast number two studio, and now he's made it to the garage for the number three studio. It's a triple crown. That is. I feel like I got on MMG like, you know, people in 2000 on crypto. <laughs> you were in early. <laughs> he was, he was early. early. I'm a believer. Yeah. And like you go back and listen to that first podcast. I had really no business having a podcast at that point. Like Tyler came on and we're like, oh, whoa. Like he, should, he should have a podcast, <laughs> which now he does. And then that's how we met Ryan. Yes. So full circle brings us right back here. So all things lead back to the M3 podcast table. Oh, dude, this so, is, you know, I feel like it's just stepped up every time too. The basement was a vibe. It um, was a vibe. We were, we were learning then. Uh, the office is sick, and this this is like a whole. It's a whole venue in here, man. Yeah, that's uh, I, I liked bringing it back home. It was something that the podcast started off as something that it was the whole experience of the whole thing. That I feel like we kind of lost that a little bit with the office. That it wasn't the the experience wasn't the same. You get the camaraderie so, effect. It was. It was like. I feel like when people come on the podcast, them coming to my home is a big deal. Yeah. And it was like, I, I felt like this was, this is what the M3 podcast was supposed to be. Yeah. I feel like I butchered it a little bit tonight when you were texting me, you know, as we were coming up, you're like, oh, dude, what are we going to do for food? And I was like, <laughs> I ruined the whole experience tonight. I, I ruined <laughs> I the whole plan. Normally we have like a full course out meal. We have food catering. Uh. And it's like. I'm going to torture these guys talking Listen, about we'll take a We'll take a rain check on that. I promise <laughs> yes. you. We'll come back just to eat. <laughs> so normally it's like you sit there and it's a full table. I mean, we can't night. just jump over. Why aren't you eating? Yeah. Yeah. So Ryan and I uh, run a sales team together and it all, it all kind of like imbued from during the month of December, our sales team doesn't really do much, but a huge piece of our job is just like mental toughness and grit. How do you stay focused? How do you develop your emotions and your discipline? And so we were talking, our leadership team, like how do we do something in separation season? You know, at my was talking about it, like what do we do this sep to separate this season? Cause we're not gonna go like sell to people over Christmas. That's ridiculous, right? But it's an early how, Christmas present. Dude, yeah. you, you get like way more people in one house. <laughs> yeah. Hey, true. Uh, hello. Santa's I know here. At, everyone's yeah, here. Oh, I <laughs> you know, honestly, though, I, I've like eliminated all my beliefs on that, too, because we sell on the 4th of July. And yeah. the first time I did, it, I'm like, oh, people are going to hate us. They don't like, dude, dude, we sell. So I've sold four on the 4th of July, like a lot of years. I would probably be people more in a good mood. I know. Yeah. Like people are chilling. Happy, Boozing. like barbecuing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, hey, what's up? Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> it's when the tech shows up, they're a little like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> you can do this during our party. I'm like, yeah. yeah, he'll be he'll be out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Won't worry about it. But we wanted to like have a separation thing. And we we're just like, oh, dude. And I have a buddy that I met. He said, he said, Actually, I had him on my podcast, but he's a successful business owner. He's just tenacious, dude. And he does this seven-day fast. And I'm like, dude, that sounds absolutely hellacious. That would be something that would push me to the limit. And we challenged the whole team to do it. We actually had like, I don't know, like 15 guys oh, yeah. step up that were like, yeah, I'll do it. Out of how many? Like 45. Mm. So not, not like a super good. That's a good percent to yeah, commit to I a seven-day fast. We, we challenge I mean, people to do whatever they wanted. You do that in the MMG crib. I mean, I'm going to be the first one to say, hey, I'm a little on the heavy side. <laughs> I don't think I'm fasting. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a unique challenge. And then 
we ran into a little hiccup because I realized like there's some actual like health concerns with it. And we're consulting a doctor and she's like, did you have anybody sign waivers or anything? I'm like, I didn't even think about that. Like what's the worst that could happen during a seven day fast? Well, I had a guy get a stroke and a heart cramp. Uh, that'd be pretty bad. I'm like, oh shit, that'd be really bad. Like, <laughs> how do we not do that? Can you do a video for a whole team? Like how not to die during seven days of not eating? <laughs> and she like sends us all the health benefits. Yeah, for good. us though, it's just like total grit, mental discipline. Can we do it? Can we, you know, abstain from the urges of food for seven days? So I, I, I'm the first one that I love the mental fight. Like I talk about it all the time of, and I don't know, one day I, I might come out and just wake up one morning and say that I'm going to try it, but it's, I've always taken on the mental fight in a very physical form that it's yeah. when I came off the couch to go run a half marathon. Like if you could tell I'm not a runner, I don't, I don't like running it. Like, <laughs> but I truly believe that was a fight that I was going to go take on. And I finished it and it was, you, you meet a different version of yourself in your head at those points when you want to quit. Oh yeah. So it's, I don't, I don't think I can imagine seven days with no food. I can't either. I'm, <laughs> I'm, struggling. I'm on like hour 50 right now. I oh think. man, you're counting the hours. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. hour by when hour. You count the hours. Yeah. Man. I started five 30 on Sunday night and the closer I get to a full week is I, I can't wait. Do you have a reservation yet? Uh, I was thinking pizza. Oh, nice. Just like a big ass pizza. But I think we were talking maybe like Brazilian steakhouse too. So I don't oh, know. Oh, man. That sounds... And you guys are going to think you're going to go in and you're going to feast. And you eat like... Uh, I won't stomach <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. eat like two things. You're going to be like, whoa, I I'm know. full. What about you? I know. Dude, the, the crazy thing, the cravings, wild. Mm -hmm. like you talk about like finding... And I think anyone's done like a big physical feat, you know, different athletic endeavors or whatever. You like the pain the non-stop like of 72 hours is where i'm at right now going on like thinking about each snack or just a little like indulgence of anything that tastes other than salt candy. or water yeah i love candy dude. <laughs> nerd a, ropes I, I literally <laughs> i told my wife i'm like i think i'm having sugar withdrawals you probably are I'm, I'm sure i, I like am pull out a nerd rope <laughs> 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 Bro, i i eat candy probably every day so i'm like what the frick dude I wish I could eat candy every day and stay thin like Tyler. <laughs> I've lost a lot of weight during this fast, though. So You do look slimmer, for sure. Yeah, I'm six pounds down in 72 hours, hmm. which is probably not good. It's like abuse, but yeah, we'll make it work. So we'll have to, when this airs, you guys will be off. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I took before photos. I want to see, because I don't know if you saw Dana White did it. Yeah. So I, actually, I did. I watched the deal when he his transformation is huge. Yeah. It looks like a year transformation. So how fast does that like come back though? I so have no idea. Like, do you drink a bottle of water and it's like bam back? Well, no, I'm drinking a shit ton of water right now. That's a good point. Yeah, that's true. I'm probably like over a gallon a day. It's the only thing I have. That's how we survive. Yeah, yeah. put some salt. And in now it. sponsored by Lacroix. Yeah, yeah, dude, this is a game changer. Just introduced to this about uh, yeah. 20 minutes ago. That's it. That's how Ricky survives all the time. LaCroix, man, it's fantastic. I, I am interested in seeing what your guys' physique looks like uh, right after and then like a month later because yeah. it can't it can't just all be fat loss. Like it has to be a lot of water that's oh, uh, for sure. mm -hmm. sub-Q. Even yeah. my muscles feel a little bit depleted. Like my lifts aren't the same. My recovery is worse. Like it's like I've- Non-existent, I would imagine. There's probably no nothing protein. to fuel you. <laughs> yeah. And so like I, I feel like way thinner, not only body fat, but like muscle composition too. It's just, it feels depleted. Yeah, the seventh day, I'm going to go just sit on the bench and see if I can hit 315 still. <laughs> and if I do, I'm just going to declare myself a superhuman. But if I don't, then or I'll probably never tell anyone. Or it's just going to crush you. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll or, die. Yeah. That, that sounds like a pet cramp. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds like a terrible idea, actually. <laughs> I think it has to be done. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just a measure of, you know, where you're at. Tyler so just go, Poop. <laughs> Just rip a peck. Yeah. So we're... At the end of 2023, and I know you guys are very goal oriented, the way that you guys, you structure your, your business um, and people that haven't listened to your guys' other podcast, let's inform them of every, everything that you do. Let's say with Vivid. Mm. So let's start, start there. Yeah. So Ryan and I run a, it's interesting, wait, I, at surface level, we run a direct to home sales uh, operation out of KC for Vivint. It's a multi-billion 
smart home company and we sell solar and smart home to residential homeowners. Um, but the, the reality of what we do is, is a lot bigger. We're basically taking, we go out, we find college or post-college people with zero sales skills and teach them how to like completely develop a professional skill set, which is a lot bigger than sales. It's all the emotional capacity discipline because most people have never really put themselves in a position to face like performance, you know, get A's and B's or whatever. Most people stay in their lane. They don't go learn a new skill, like the reality of it. And they don't go take anything on that's measured, like black and white measured like sales is. You can get a B and you're like, oh, I'm a B student. Or you can, you know, join the B team or you make the JV or VART. Like you either sell or you don't. And like the reality of that skill set and how you develop that is pretty eye opening to a lot of people. And it kind of like breaks a lot of insecurities and brings them to the, the surface. We have a saying on our team, like when you come and you work for us, you're gonna like put yourself under a magnifying glass because you're dealing with strangers all day long. I have no idea you're coming. Like we knock on doors. Uh, you're gonna feel everything that you really feel about yourself, but you're afraid to admit. Yeah, and I, I think it's funny in today's world how many people fear sales. Oh, that dude. it is like people are terrified of it. People are terrified to have someone say no to them. And I, 18 year old me, I jump in the car business and I'm like, well, what if I call someone and they say no? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, and it's funny we look at it now where I'm like, I don't give a shit if someone says no. Like, yeah. But at that time, I, I had it developed those calluses. I hadn't developed that that mindset. I hadn't developed that. And it's funny that everyone is watching the. Andy Elliott's of the world. They're watching the Brad Lees out there. They're watching Gary V's. They're watching the Grant Cardones. They're watching just all of these guys out there that they all have one common denominator. They understand sales. And it's like when you look at that, that all these people that pe that someone shares on Instagram, their motivational reel that they put up, that this and that. And it's like, but then they're doing something so off the wall different and they think they're going to get those results. Like figure out how to sell in today's world. And it, like you said, it's black and white. You can go into sales in so many different avenues and directly correlate to what you do and get paid. And it's like, but people are so fearful of what other people think and someone saying no, that it will always hinder them from ever being that person that they want to be. And it's like, my question is like, how do you go out and find these guys? Like, what is it like? What is that character trait? Like, what is it when you see that person? You're like, that's the guy. You know, that's an interesting question. And we, we spend a lot of time yes, uh, professionally because that, that's really like our business, right? Is finding, developing brand new talent. Um, and Ryan's a great example of that. Ryan just, you know, you guys have listed his story, but crazy bartending, never made more than like 30K in a year after college. And he made like over a hundred grand in four months and he's never done the skill set. So it's just like literally just wills the skill set to happen. And it's like, okay. And then we, we try to like reverse engineer. What is it that Ryan has? What is it that, you know, former guys, myself, like that create this ability to succeed in the arena. And the crazy thing is, is we have another guy on our team who's one of my five-year reps. And if like he was sitting in this room right now, you might not even like, no, he's, if you know him really well, he's really funny and he's like pretty charismatic, but he's super introverted. Like never wants to be in front of the team. He's just not like gonna go rally the troops. This dude is so good. He's been our number one rep the last two years. And so it's like me and Ryan are both kind of like very extrovert. Like we're outgoing, we go do these things. This dude's like, it's so opposite. And he's like lights out. And so our whole thing for us, more than anything, I think we, we've we assessed it's, the will to actually win and the commitment to it. I've told like reps ask me, what's the number one secret sauce? I'm like an unconditional commitment, uh, a commitment that no matter what, how good or bad you're doing, you're still going to seek excellence. Because what most people have, and we see all the time is they have a conditional commitment. If it works within the first month, I'll keep going. If it works within six weeks, I'll keep going. If I make money, if I hit these marks, if it's easy, if it doesn't hurt too bad, if my wife likes it, if my mom lets it, if my teacher says yes, if all the stars align, I'll keep going. But like in your business, our business, there is no perfect scenario. Like no. it's shoveling <laughs> shit and it's like, dude, it's adapted on the fly all the time. And it's always just like, dude, there's there's never a perfect business. There's never a perfect fulfillment. It's always just like, how are you gonna develop the skill set? The market's changing, you gotta run it. 
and you had a nail on the head, you say the word adapt, which I see it in businesses all the time that we, we are very lucky in the fact that we get this microscope on all these different business models all, all day, every day. And the businesses that you see adapt quickly and on the fly are the ones that win. The people that are scared of change, that's like, hey, this is the way it's that we've always done it, this way we're gonna keep doing it. It's almost sad watching those business owners. And they're doing a disservice to the people that work for them and that work for that company that have put their blood, sweat, and tears into it to sit there and say that we're not gonna change and we're gonna keep doing it the same way and it's not working. Like, and it's, when you're adapting, I can tell just from the the first podcast till now on how much different you are. Yeah. How much more well-rounded you are in so many aspects of life. But it's like cool watching people grow that I, th- I think that's what you bring to the table. And that's why you attract that talent is it's well, you guys are walking the walk every day. It's not like you're telling people to do shit that you're not doing. And that's I see that. Once again, all the time, I see business owners that say, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z. I don't do any of that shit, but this is what you need to do to be successful. Our first blitz. So we go on like blitzes, like little microscopic, like tastes of what the summer is going to be like. And I go down, I forget where we were, like Houston or something. Yeah. And dude, I'm a, at the, at this time, I'm like 31, 32 year old guy. And we're going to share this space with like 16, 17 other team members. I get my bags. I'm coming off the airport. I get my rental car. I go to the place and every the place is packed. Kids sleeping everywhere. People got dibs on the bed, the master bedroom, all everything's taken. And Ty's the one guy literally sleeping on the floor with his head in what was it like toilet paper as his pillow. <laughs> and I'm like, a, what the hell? Paper towels. Yeah, paper towels. Like what? <laughs> like we had a talk after it. And I'm like, dude, uh, what? What? Don't you like this living situation could be better. He's like, dude. I don't care is I'm the person that they're going to see doing all this stuff, living on the floor, sacrificing this. Nobody's going to do that if I don't lead the way doing that. He's a walking example of what you just said. Yeah. At that point, I was like, holy shit, like that, that hits me hard. And, And I think that does hit people, but it's also showing people the path. Oh, yeah. That it's in our world today. Everyone and their mother is can is telling everyone how to do something. Mm and it's i've had people come my way that people i'm friends with people i know they're like well so and so told me i should be doing this this and this with my money and i'm like i wouldn't listen to a bit of financial advice that person (laughs) told me i'm like what are they doing well they watched a video on tiktok or they watched this over here they read a book i'm like but that doesn't mean they know how to do it like the walking the walk of what you do every day it's you have to be the example people follow like, and I've always looked at it as I should live the life that people are wanting to achieve. And it, it when you're doing that in everything, and it's not just from a financial spot, yep. it should be your relationship. It should be the friendships that you have. It should be what you do with your personal time, what you're doing physically, what you're doing on all these different forefronts that they're like, that's the, that's the person I follow. No, dude, you, you hit it right on the head. We, we actually just had a huge meeting on this and we're we're talking about it a lot in our organization. And, you know, Ed Milet's talked about it a little bit. If you've ever seen one of his keynotes, we had him in. But it's, it's the whole idea of if you truly want people to follow and you want to develop a culture, you're building a business, you're building a sales team, you have to be an aspirational figure. And it's so much bigger than financial because people can like the skill set that you have that gets finances, but they can hate the marriage you have and they can hate the sacrifices and the prices that you pay. Somebody has to want to trade places with you to truly follow you. Like they want to believe the things that you believe in the way that you believe them. And nobody will do that if they don't truly believe you do believe those things and you're operating inside those beliefs. But when they do, like there's nothing more powerful. And that's, and my let says, he's like, when you have people follow you, they don't have to believe your vision. The only thing that they have to believe is that you believe in that vision. Yeah. To where it's like, as crazy as it may seem, if everyone around you believes that you believe in that, then they they feel that it's possible. Oh yeah. And yeah. it's, I thought when I, when I started Moss Marketing Group, it'd be me kind of running this like head honcho spot that it was gonna be like, everyone's gonna learn from everything I do. And it's pretty cool 
how it's actually the complete opposite. Like where <laughs> I, I bring all like all these people come to the table. Like when Ricky started, I mean, it was like I was like a, a sponge soaking up all the knowledge that Ricky had that he was a thousand times better at content creation. He lived that poster life that like we talk about, like we're we're talking about the 75 hard that I'm like, all he has to do is do an outdoor workout and he's doing 75 hard all the time. That's his life. But it was just like he had those pillars that it was like that I had a crazy high respect for that. I was like, this is the dude he's, he's walking the walk. Like it wasn't just a, somebody that talks about it, that there's too many people out there that just talk about it and oh, they yeah. never take action. Mm. We have on our whiteboard in our office, <clears throat> how you do one thing is how you do everything. And when it comes to this stuff, I kind of think that it's important to teach people the skill as far as what we do. It's important to teach people the skill of selling and the work part of it. But I would argue that everything else is more important, like the relationship building, your relationship with your emotions, the things that we teach and like the relationships that we build. One, it's why I'm here, but it also bleeds into everything work related. And at the end of the day, it's a job. But like your time here on Earth, or I guess, in my opinion, is to form relationships with like minded people and just enjoy the time. So I think if you zoom in on what we're talking about here, I think the other things outside of the work are even more important and it bleeds off into the work. I 100% agree with that because up until March of this year, I would put work before everything else. And I did it in the car business. I'm like, I'm starting, I'm getting out of the car business. So I'm, work's not the forefront. And there was a very short stint of time. Like when MMG was launching, we didn't have enough work that it wasn't like consuming all my time. And then it kind of just, blew up and then all of a sudden it was like i reverted back exactly to where i was before yeah and i wasn't going to the gym i wasn't taking care of myself i wasn't putting madison first like all these things just weren't dialed in and it it was one of those days that i finally took a step back and i'm like am i the version of myself that i want to be and i could not look in the mirror and say yes to that and it's hard to do that sometimes oh yeah and when i sat there i'm like if somebody looked at everything right now, I don't think people would want to trade places with me. They may for the financial yeah. part of it, but everything else I had going on wasn't right. And at that point I turned it around and I was like, I put myself first. I'm going to start taking care of myself. And I'm like, and I'm going to put Madison before the company. And I was like, I'm going to do those two things in my social life and friends and the people that mean a lot to me. And I was like, and wherever Moss marketing group goes, it goes. I like that. And all of a sudden it was like, Foof. yeah, and I'm like, it was like, we turned on like rocket boosters overnight. And yes. I'm like, when I started taking care of myself better, I was operating better. My energy levels were different. Just everything yeah. just amplified. You know, what's crazy though, is the reason you found that out is because you prioritized the wrong thing first and learned from it. Like you wouldn't yep. have got to where you are now, not having gone through it in the first place. And the crazy thing is I see people go through a whole entire life. Yeah that never figure that out. Yeah. I see people that are 60 years old that still haven't figured out that one thing. Dude, I think, uh, you know, Ryan and I talk about, about this because when we're recruiting people, right, we're, we're bringing people into a commission-only space. And and you guys know this as well. We're starting a business, commission-only sales. People are so afraid of that. Terrified. They are so afraid to put their like own worth on the line and have to acknowledge I may not be as good as I tell people I am or tell myself I am for a while. But what's so interesting is we've met with so many people, potential reps who are like, I want this life. I want this relationship. I want this health. Well, your current path has like negative 0% opportunity for that <laughs> to ever pay out. Why would you not just go try something else? And it really just comes down to fear. So many people are so afraid to even put themselves in a situation to find out what they don't have that they just won't ever do it. hundred percent. They just yeah. live in this like this little comfort bubble, but it's amazing because when you sit down with people and it's like, we are trying to assess like what, what, what makes somebody willing to do that? And I, I don't know what the exact, if, if I could bottle it, right? We'd probably all be billionaires, whatever. If we could find out like, what makes people super successful. Are we going to become yeah. crazy rich? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah, we, yeah, yeah, it was going to be sick. But, I think there's there's a little aspect, just the more you put yourself in situations where like as a business owner, as a sales rep, you have black and white evidence that you are not as good as you think you are. 
all the time. Yeah. And it, but some people are like, even Ryan's asked me, he's like, how is that stressful? You know, is that like all the different things you have to take on? It's like, when you do it enough, it becomes almost exhilarating to realize like, Hey, I hit this wall and I tried as hard as I could and it didn't work. But like somebody else says is good enough. Like, what do we need to do now? Like now, where do we go? And that's like a fun place to realize, like, I'm totally cool with the fact that it, the mark wasn't there today, but I'm freaking going to find a way to get the mark there tomorrow. Yeah. And it's, it's funny how, like you talk about how good people think they are. Like I started MMG and I was like right out the gate and I'm like, dude, I am like the guy. And I'm like the guy. And it came like a year and a half in. I'm sitting in the driveway and I'm like, I don't know how the fuck I'm gonna pay payroll tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, I actually kind of suck at this. And I was like, I'm like sitting in my truck, like breaking down. I'm like, but it was, it's hard to, to have that happen. That it was like, I had always excelled at everything I did. But it was like, at that point, it would have been really easy for me just to hang it up and go back to what I knew, what I knew was safe. But it's like, I came in, I told Mass, I'm like, I'm fucking bet it all. I was like, I'm I'm gonna bet it all and I'm either gonna take it to the moon or I'm gonna take it to the bottom of the ocean, one of the two. <laughs> and I'm like, at least it goes somewhere. It doesn't end th this way. And it's like, and I see, I see it with people inside of businesses all the time too, that are fearful of taking that step to be the person they're supposed to be inside of a company. That it's not always just entrepreneurs, it's just, it's people in general. Oh, yeah. And entrepreneurs that are W or even W two employees that yeah. want their promotion, dude. Like, and it's I. I'll say this week we have a. I'm, I'm going to give Ricky high kudos on bringing David to the table. There's a, a new guy that we were talking about. I actually brought the. Oh, yeah, I told if there was an employee of the week, it was going to be him this week. But <laughs> yeah, congrats, uh, Ricky brings this guy to the table and people are always asking for different computers, more equipment, things like that. It's just nature of what we do. And Dre told him, he goes, if you want something, he goes, you go to Dane and you justify it correctly. Like he's normally pretty open-minded about it. And it was the next day at like noon, I get an email with a full presentation. I'm talking the nicest presentation I have seen since I've opened Moz Marketing Group <laughs> that I'm like, God damn. I call the whole entire office. I'm like, to the conference room, uh, airplane up on the TV. I'm like, if you guys want to get something in here, I go, take notes. And everyone's like, whoa. And I was just like, <laughs> but it was that initiative. It was that like the the presentation of it, like how it was done, that he fully processed what it took to get to the next level himself. Like we didn't, and that's the thing is, I think you can help people get there, but at the end of the day, they, they have to want it. They have to have that that hunger for it. And it's like taking that step up that, I mean, that changed my viewpoint of him like immediately. Parable of oranges. Yep. You ever heard the parable of the oranges? No. It's a, it's a Forbes article. We, we, we read it with our leadership team every year. Um, but parable of the oranges, there's, I can tell you quick, but there's two employees, one guy, it's like in a corporate kind of wall street environment. The, the one employee is like paying his dues, just eating shit, trying to climb the corporate ladder for years and years and years. And there's a partnership opportunity that opens up. And he thinks like, dude, I'm a shoe in. I've been paying the dues. Boss loves me. Like I'm the guy. And he goes in and sits down and the boss is like, oh, like um, the other guy got it. And it's a guy who's only been there like a year, young dude, like brand new to the company. And he's all pissed off. And he's like, well, let me, let me break it down for you. I'll explain the, he's like, I need you to go get me some oranges. He's like, okay, what the frick? So he goes, buys some oranges, comes back, and the boss is like, okay, like, you know, what kind of oranges do you get? He's like, I don't know. He's like, how much were they? He's like, I don't know the receipts right there. I just, you just told me to get some oranges. I got some oranges. He's like, oh, okay, just sit right here. And then the employee who got the promotion, who got the partnership part, comes in and he's like, oh, like, uh, where's your oranges? He's like, oh, well, I don't have them. Um, when you called me and asked me to get some oranges, I just assumed, like, oh, well, there must be a reason for these oranges. So I called your assistant and she said that it was because your wife was having an, a party. So I called your wife and asked what the oranges were for. And then she told me they were for orange juice. So when I went to the grocer, I found out what are the best oranges for orange juice. And then I got a better deal because I bought a bunch of them for your wife's party. And I dropped them off at your house. So your wife was ready with the orange juice and I already put the receipt in um, to, to accounting. So they, they processed the, 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 the bill. <laughs> and the dude just walks out. He's like, I get it. 
And, and the whole idea <laughs> totally makes sense. Now. Yeah, the whole idea is this: is right. It's just like when you own your results, like you dig deeper into the details of like why things need to be the way they are, and you optimize every opportunity. And like that right there is like as a leader, as an owner, or even as an employee, like that's how you really dominate. Like you care. You you don't just fulfill tasks. Like you find out why. What is the purpose of the task? What's the end goal of the task? And you don't wait for other people to tell you. Yeah. You just go take initiative. And that's, I think that taking initiative is a huge part in any role anywhere. That if that person, if you are a person that takes initiative in what you do all the time, climbing the ladder in business, climbing the ladder at places is not that difficult. Because in today's world, there's not a lot of people out there doing it. Not a bunch of slap dicks. <laughs> it is. But it's like people out there that all they do is they talk about it, they think that they're owed it. They, they think I'm going to go there. I'm just going to put in just hell of time and then it's going to show up that it's like, and the crazy thing is like, I think about it just within the MMG walls and like, we've only been open like three and a half years. Like it's a very, very, very short time frame that we're talking on, but it's like, I already see like the standouts. I already see like, and the crazy thing is like, I can go and have a sit down with someone that I don't directly tell them what they need to do but it's giving them the opportunity and then they step up to the plate. And that's what I like is I don't want to have to hold someone's hand every single step of the way that let people start having those, those wins that they start learning because then it's better for them in the future. Because if they're always reliant on me to get that win, then there's a, there's a break in the process. If you take 17 people and you teach them how to win every single day and think on their own, you want to talk about a ship that starts moving really fucking fast? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's scale. Mm -hmm. and, and that that really is. That is what scale looks like. That is what they start thinking about how to make their processes more efficient. They start thinking about they're coming to you not with problems but solutions. And I learned it from Corey with CP. He, he said, the number one thing I've done since I've opened was he goes, in the first couple of years, he goes, I start hiring people and he goes, I just had problem after problem after problem. He goes, I implemented, if anyone came to me with a problem, they had to have the solution already. Mm -hmm. And he goes, it was amazing. He goes, just people stopped coming to me. Like they figured <laughs> out how to, like most of the time people just don't take a second to actually figure out the solution. And I've even seen guys that they do like a three option deal where it's like you come to with a problem, you have to have three different options on how to fix it, which when you start doing that, people are like, okay, that was kind of stupid that I even went to them with that. Mm -hmm. That They just need... No, it's like, you're right. That was the point. <laughs> they, and then it's like, they start learning how to problem solve that I feel problem solving is a huge key to sales. Oh, yeah. Like, that is the... I feel like one of the biggest pillars of sales is people have problems, you're trying to solve them, and it's identifying what those problems are and being the solver there all the time. And it's on whatever it is, and it's in life, if you have a relationship and you have problems and you can't figure out how to solve them, guess what? You're always going to have problems. And most of the time people want to say, I'd say nine out of 10 times, the problem most of the time is you. Yeah, we, we, we talk about this in our, our, our meetings all the time because it's, it's amazing that how conditioned people are to blame circumstances or whatever. And, and in sales, like, my favorite thing is, you know, when somebody bitches about a neighborhood or turf, or whatever, I'll just go sell behind them and be like, oh, that's crazy. Like the <laughs> well, same doors that had no idea I was coming by magically found the money to buy a product. That's, a, that's amazing. But you, you hit it right on the head. It's just we teach everyone like, dude, the only variable all across your life is you. And so it's like if you're getting these consistent results everywhere you go that are not peak optimum results, like you're probably the reason they're getting them. If everybody at the door tells you the same thing, like you're triggering this response. And until you can step back and say, I'm the issue every time I'm getting these deals to this point, I'm the reason that this isn't happening. I'm the reason my relationships suck. I'm the reason my health is bad. Like you, you can't fix it. And that's, I think self-awareness, Ryan, I talk about this all the time. I think it's just an, it's an underrated superpower. It, it, and once again, I feel that, I mean, we talk about this all the time about how easy, how easy it is to dominate in our space against our generation. Like 
the generations are getting weaker and weaker and weaker. <laughs> that like the self awareness thing is like becoming like a. Dude, did you see the the po- the stat that Hermosi put up the other day? This is like right on the note of self awareness. They they ran a poll. I think it was like a Forbes oh, yeah. study. <laughs> they ran a poll. Fifty one percent of graduating oh, seniors I saw think like genuinely wholeheartedly believe that they will be millionaires by the time they're twenty five. But the actual stat is like less than half a percent. Oh yeah. And it, dude, it's so true though. Like the, where am I versus what the frick does it take to even like think about that or run the math? They haven't even like started to put a, an equation together. If I need to earn this and invest in this and get this percentage and live on this for the next eight years of my life, or I don't even have a chance. They just like flippantly believe, well, if I just go to college and start a YouTube channel along the way, then I'll be a millionaire. And you know, the, the crazy thing was like, I fall, I fell right in that stat. <laughs> like I had no earthly idea how much life actually cost. I was sitting there doing the numbers of what I would make a year, like in the car business, which was, I was making way more than the average person. And I was like, I'm going to be making like, I mean, groves of money. Like I'm doing the math. I'm like, I'm definitely gonna be a millionaire by 25. And then I'm like, at 25, I'm like, hmm, that did. I think I mi- I think I fucked up my math so much. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I was pretty good at math. And, but it's like, they don't understand what the real world is and they're not taught what the real world is. They don't, they can't even fathom how much a million dollars is. Dude, I think, yeah, right on that too. And I think even more than like what the amount of money is, I think people just so take for granted the amount of work that somebody who's actually pulled it off is done. Oh yeah. Like their, their level, I talk to people all the time. We're interviewing college kids. We'll meet at a career fair and they're like, oh, what's your GPA? Eh, normal 3.0. Okay, uh, whatever, that's cool. You know, what's your ambitions? Eh, I, I, I want to, you know, have all the freedom. I want to retire at 30. Okay, like, well, what type of internships you do? Well, I don't want to do anything in the summer because I need summers for my friends. Not the guy. Like, homie, homie <laughs> like, on what planet do you live that you think that you're going to get these, like, top quarter percentile of people in the world results, but you're going to do the same flipping thing that every normal-ass college kid does? Like, what makes you so freaking special? That before the podcast started, we were talking about stepping in the ring. Like, we're talking about the arena that we, we get up and we step into every day. And it's like, I look at people that are out there like that, that think that they're going to get up and that they think they're going to make this money and they're going to compete against me. Get out of here. Like, <laughs> I'm not scared of that person one fucking bit. I think not a, even an a inch. I think a big part of that whole culture growing up now is all they see is highlights like mm-hmm. Instagram, TikTok. It's private jets. It's cars that they rented. That's not really theirs. It's just people putting out their best version of themselves, even though if it's false. But I think what this hit me, we have a guy named J. Lou that talked to us my first time in Utah. His whole presentation in front of the entire organization was of his lowlights. Everything that got messed up and everything that derailed him and everything that was against him on his way to become what he is now. That hit me way harder. Because then I got to see, holy shit, he's still going. He lost his whole team. He's still going. His wife got cancer, whatever. He's still going. Like adversity is going to hit all the time. But seeing what he went through that hardly anybody harps on like the low lights and post stuff that's hard and post stuff when they almost quit. And he's where he is right now because he just never quit during the low lights, which I thought was, hit me hard. And that that is something that. Those aren't the things that are posted all over social media. Yeah. That isn't the shit that gets engagement. Like, and it's it's one of those things that you're po- you're posting out there. You're posting the highlights. Like, a- as a business owner, we want all the highlights to show off the culture, to show off all the fun times at the office. Like, that's what gets the the future people come in our direction. Like, yeah. that's what you want to show. And once, like, I have a another buddy that's starting a podcast, and his podcast all is on people that are successful, but the journey to get there. Hmm. that I've had a lot of people I've ran into that are much older than me that have success, but you go through their story. Like even you, you grant Cardone's books, like he was doing drugs at 30. Yeah. And I sit there and think about where I'm at right now at 29. And it's like, oh, I feel like I've got a, a leg up. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, but you look at the progression that can happen of just pressing forward. Like the only way you fail is if you quit Yeah, and it's getting up. And I look at every day, am I competing in the ring? Am I putting in my best foot every day I get up? 
And that's on every forefront. That's not just business. That's am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing in my relationship? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing in the gym? Am I supposed to be doing all these different things? That this morning when I'm heading to the gym at four o'clock, did I want to go? No. But I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm looking at myself in the mirror. I'm like, you're fucking pathetic, bro. <laughs> I'm like literally sitting there looking at myself. I'm like, you have a full day ahead of you and you better get your ass moving. Because if not, you're not going to make it. But it's like most people would have just chalked it up as like canceled everything for the day, laid their ass in bed and given up. Oh, yeah. So I think you brought up something. You, you said, you know, I, I don't want to do it. And I've had this conversation with a lot of people in, in sales, especially we've had reps and they're like, you know, I just, I just trying to find the motivation. I just need to be, I'm just not as motivated as I was when I first started. Like, I don't give a shit about motivation. Like you think like where I'm at, I, I was in the 1%, like became a millionaire at 25, saved and pinched and sold, did everything I could to like hit those numbers. I'm like, did you really think I need to be here on this blitz this week knocking with you? <laughs> You think I want to? I got two kids and a wife at home. My wife has crazy anxiety. You think I want to be here? I'm motivated to get out in the rain and the snow and come knock with you. No. Like, actually, like, this is why I dream. This, this is it. <laughs> this, yeah. I'm like, yeah, freaking, yeah. But like, it, there, there's almost like this, this weird perception that I feel like society is kind of permeated. Like any type of struggle, pain, or anxiety, or stress is just like to be avoided at all costs. And it's just not real. Like, I don't know when in the human existence we decided that we we're going to stop like feeling pain, but like, welcome to mortality. Uh, that's just a part of the process. So you, you just need to embrace it. That's, I tell everyone that on the, the other side of uncomfort is where you find greatness. That if you're not pushing yourself to an uncomfortable level every single day, then you're doing something wrong. And it's on, there are so many things that I take on that, I mean, we look at each other and we're like, we're going to figure it out. Like, and it's, it was funny in the beginning, those uncomfortable things, like I, it keep me awake at night. Like, and I was like, I had that imposter syndrome for a while. And I'm like, am, am I this guy? Like, and then all of a sudden I started putting the right people around me. I'm like, we are those fucking people. I'm like, we are the ones that take it on that. Like we go and we bid things that are going up against the biggest market agencies in the country now. And we're getting the accounts. We have offerings. They don't. And it's like, we've placed ourselves to be those people. And it's not just me at this point. It's a whole group of people that it's overcoming that. It's a lot more fun taking on those big challenges with an army. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible without it. I, I think there's certain things that like there's uncomfortable things that you take on, but it's like, as the people around me get more, refine and get better at what they do it makes me more aggressive that like that ag aggression just builds and builds and builds that like in the beginning i'm like i'm the best market around but like in my head i'm like not a fucking chance i'm like <laughs> <laughs> i'm just telling people that i'm like and now now it's like i'm saying it i'm like i have 200 percent confidence and i'm like they're all a lot better than me i'm like they know what they're doing but it's just having that to tee off all the time that it's surrounding yourself with the correct team that i think makes those uncomfortable waters so easy to charter and it's you're just you're after it and it's like you're built for it like the people around you are built for it i think too you know i this is an interesting thing too because it's sometimes i'll have a rep will they'll you know they'll come and ask me like how do you how do you handle all these things because we we take for granted a little bit too when we look you know five ten years down the road like i think about all the time my rookie year like my first year in sales and what I'm able to do now in like from a sales standpoint, management, all the investments, I manage a real estate fund too. Like I got a lot of shit going on. I got kids, a wife, like if I had to deal with like the level of just things I have to deal with today, like six years ago, I'd have freaking imploded. Like I would have, <laughs> I, I would have literally had a panic attack. I would have just been, you'd have found me somewhere in a freaking under the, under the bridge, bro. <laughs> but like in today, like, those moments of a sleepless night and always staying at the cusp. When you look back for th three years, four years, like you realize how far you've come as an emotional, like as a person, as a man, as a father, as a husband, like those are the things that are so fun. And that's where like in my business, we talk about this, like, yes, I want to push the business. Yes, I have these financial goals, but a lot of it is like, I need to stay on this cusp of healthy anxiety and stress because it makes me more equipped. When my wife comes to me and my daughter's like, got this thing, I'm like, 
it's really hard to get me worked up now yeah. to like be stressed and anxious. Like it has to be a pretty high pressure, high tense situation. And it's not overnight, but like, I think people don't understand you're going to have those moments in life, whether you want them or not. So you might as well choose them now because you're more prepared for the ones when they come. And I think you're always building to that next level. Like if you're growing, you're building to that next level that I look at the things I take on today to three and a half years ago. Once again, I would have imploded. Like I was not ready for what I take on today. It's funny what stressed me out three years ago. Oh, for real. You look back at like the, the stressing points. I'm like, I'm, really? But it's a lot of times what helps me with that is I look at the guys that are a hundred steps in front of me. I'm like, they would laugh at me right now if I said this was stressing me out. Like literally laugh me out of the room. Like if I came to them with the problems that I thought I had right now. Dude, that happened to me all season this year when I called this guy <laughs> all year long. We literally had therapy sessions on this. <laughs> My first year in sales, I thought the world was ending because things were getting in the way of me getting some numbers. I call him, he's like, dude, just do this, do this, do this, do this. Everything's fine. Yeah. But in the moment when I'm like heated and passionate and I feel like it's getting taken away from me, I'm like, dude, I just want to set records. What's going on here? And he's like, I sat in that same spot. Yeah. He's like, I know exactly what you're going through. But then when I hear, it's not even like what he says is accurate, but like his demeanor when he's talking to me about these things makes me zoom out. I'm like, holy shit, this dude's been doing this for seven years. This is not a big deal. I need to relax and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. It is. So, so Ty, what do you feel like has changed in that? Is it just exposure over time has changed your level of what stresses you out? Are you more organized? What's what made that switch? Yeah, I think combination of things for sure. I think your organization develops. Um, I think when you're when you're at that cusp of like your current ability, you have to get pretty resourceful and you're kind of forced to like, OK, like how do I free up this time? How do I create this opportunity? Like, how do I make this less of a like Hail Mary <laughs> and create more of a reality that this can be, can be controlled. I think the more and more you put yourself in those situations, you kind of make micro adjustments in your organization. And then I would say the biggest thing when you're at the cusp of your abundant, like your, your mental, physical, whatever your talent, your skill or your business is, you, you develop a really big abundance mindset. Because just like any business, everyone you've ever talked to is like build a big business. The more and more people you meet, you're like, holy shit, you almost lost it like 10 times. But like you you didn't and you made it. And you, the only thing you didn't do is just quit. And like every time you have one of those moments yourself, where you're like, dude, I was literally this close, like on the curve, like, dude, uh, this might be it. You know, like at the end of the season, like, dude, that was really stressful. This might be it or, or whatever. And you just keep going anyway. You're like dividend, like that deposit to yourself of like, I can freaking handle this. I can handle this. I can handle this. Builds and it's just like what you can handle just explodes. And you don't notice it real time, but when you look back, you're like, dude, a cell canceling used to freaking freak me the hell out. I used to lose sleep over that. Now I'm like, when they call me and they're pissed, I'm like, look, dude, here's what we can do. If you want it, take it. If not, I gotta go. Like, <laughs> if you're not gonna buy, dude, I gotta get your living room because I got places to be. Like, and you just, you just, you, I, it's almost like a conditioning of high tense situations. And your abundance that like you can win these and there's enough other things out there for you to win, like just blossoms, I think. I think you start also becoming more aware of your time. Yeah. That I think when you when you say that all these things are happening and becoming more resourceful to get to the next step, like it took me a long time to understand that. I was like, you know, I'm just going to outwork everyone, out grind them every single day. And it's like th that got us moving, but that's not scalable. <laughs> when you have every piece of the process and it's like, and we're working on it right now of like tearing down an MMG that we're having the same kind of deals that like I've talked to Ricky. I'm like, he has a full content team under him now. I'm like, you have to offload and focus on what your time is and how do you free up more of your time to make a bigger impact? And it's like, when you look at those things that that was, and it's, it's really easy to say now. And it's like, I, I mean, I was, if someone would have told me that like, uh, two years ago, I'd be like, what the fuck are you now? Like, <laughs> how are you telling me to do this? But it's like, when you see, after you get through it, you're like, holy shit, why was that so hard for me to figure out? Because the light on the other side, you start solving bigger problems and it's, you free up time to actually navigate those problems correctly to make much bigger moves forward. But it's like, sometimes you get so focused on that micro movement that you can't focus on the the big step that's actually there. And 
I, I was trying to hire salespeople and I was hiring people that weren't at my caliber. And I'm like, that was shit wasn't getting closed. And then I'm like, I haven't earned that yet. But it's like, I did figure out that's where I was like, I had them doing sales and I was editing videos. And I'm like, on my computer up there doing shit. I'm like, uh, we should hire this out and I should get back to selling because that makes the biggest impact. That's a bigger problem that I'm solving. Yeah. To where it's like, there's just different things that you're doing, but it's once you start, like, like you said, now you're not going to sit on the phone with somebody that's pissed off about something for X amount of time. Your time's valuable now to where it's like, this is what I can do. This is how I'm going to solve your problem. If not, you can sit there and you let yourself in the mirror. It's not going to be me. So have, have a great day. <laughs> like, but you, you become much more, I don't know, your time becomes more valuable. Yeah, it's, there's, there's so much introspection. I've, I've, sales is just such an interesting career too and, and a, a skill set because it really is your emotions against your yourself all the time. And, and at the beginning, you think like, oh, these people hate me. This sucks. You know, like I ran into a bunch of assholes today or, or whatever. At the end of the day, like, dude, it, it really is just your subconscious like view of yourself gets pulled to the surface every day because when you're taking rejection over and over and over and over and over and over again to be able to say like i'm still the same guy i still have the best product i still have this opportunity i still have this service i have this this deliverable and go treat that next person it's way harder than people anticipate okay. over a long period of time and it wears on you but it also like builds something in you that's really unique where you get to look at yourself on a much deeper level and find out like, hey, you know, dude, I, I haven't really dealt with this. Um, this is an issue. Like, this is a me thing. I got to fix this shit yeah. <laughs> so you can go to the next level. I think it just, to me, I, I love I love that it sales in your control. But I think the biggest thing that, that we love, we talk about a lot is just the, it's I think the best opportunity to find out about yourself and why you are holding you back. Yeah, I think that that variable right there, your relationship with your emotions is, in my opinion, the number one thing in our sales industry. I'm new to the sales industry as a whole, but what we do, it extends hot streaks and it just immediately stops cold streaks. It's like if you're talking to a person and they shit on you and say no, slam the door in your face, whatever, to totally feel that and then neutralize it and go to the next door like it didn't even happen is a superpower. I think that I tried to take on energy. We've talked about this a lot. If it's like a high amount of frustration or fear, or anger, or anxiety, it's a high level of emotion, period. Label it whatever you want. You can use that same level of high emotion and fuel it towards productivity at the same level. So they're both up here, regardless of whatever emotion you want to label it. So it's only like, almost like alchemizing it within you and then using it as productivity to fuel you to get what you want to get. Mate, I haven't really thought about it that way. But and it, it, it's something that what I think you guys have done really, really well at on the sales forefront that I see that the auto industry lacks a lot is the auto industry is the strong survive, the weak dropout. There's no helping the weak. You come in and there's superstars that stand out and then there's the bottom of the barrel that bleed themselves out and they get out of sales and they fucking hate it forever. Hmm. Like you have two forefront and there's dealerships that kind of help with some training and things like that. But it's something that you have guys in there that are mediocre. They make just enough money to get by. And it's like, they just kick the can down the road forever. And it's like really when you break down what they make like hourly, they would be better off like working at a fast food joint. Like it's not getting done. But it's they don't make it happen. And it's realistically that loses money for car dealerships, so they don't recognize it because finding great salespeople is crazy difficult. But like you said, you have to build them. And like yeah, just finding some random dude off the street that's like just lights out, it's a unicorn. Like yeah. uh, there's a better chance I see a unicorn walk down this road <laughs> than just some sales guy walks up and is like, Hey dude, I'm the best there is. And this hundred percent commission base cool with me. This is how it's going to work. Blah, blah, blah. I would literally probably faint in my, in my front door and just fall on the ground. The building part's my favorite part. Yeah. I think Ty loves it too, but like bringing him into this culture and we're 
starting something relatively new with our new team, but just having guys come around and hang out with us. And kind of like we talked about earlier about it's beyond sales. It's beyond Vivint. It's beyond work. It's how we do everything. We have relationships together. We have trust together. We can talk about anything together. We're doing anything outside of work together. We're hooping. We're going to eat. We're going to top golf. whatever. We're starving together. Starving <laughs> together. Yeah, <laughs> shitty as it is. But that's the culture. That's the only reason that I'm here. Vivint's cool. The stuff we sell is cool. Money comes as a byproduct. But I'm here for the relationships and the things that are bigger than work. And I think that's a trend that's happening right now in business that I think is going to become a lot, a lot larger here in the next three to five years is the culture build on companies that I feel like we've done well to this point, but I don't think we've done well enough. That it's like, I feel like we've been, and we were talking about this week at the office that up until just recently, probably like a couple months ago, I'm like, dude, we are just smoking the competition. But it's I, I don't know why I did it, but I started focusing on the Midwest, and I I always used to be really good about like watching nationwide, being the trendsetter from that from the coast in, and I started looking, and I was like, we've been looking that like we were beating the people around us here, and I was like, we have to set a new standard that's so fucking far out there that no one can catch it. And it's like, and it starts with the culture side. That that's why people have came our way, that we have a lot of great people that we haven't put out ads for employees. We have acquired, every person that's at MMG has been acquired off a relationship built somewhere or off following us on social. But it's they see a culture, and I feel like, once again, we've done well so far, but there's another level that I look at what you guys are doing and I'm like, there's a standard that's above. That it's like, if we're stepping in the ring, we gotta step up our game and not just visualize it as our space. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing. I, I do think that commission only sales and building teams and commission only sales is like a master course in culture because right like what we don't have is we can't just go find that talent and say like dude here's a salary cuz you're that guy and that's safe like we you you can do that in a lot of companies you can have great culture and there's still a lot of like other variables right but you have to provide and you have to learn how to create an environment where somebody off the street believes in you a complete stranger or a referred stranger enough to say i will leave my current situation and put my total faith and trust in you, your program, your operation, your skill set to get me to be financially stable or financially excellent. Like we can't just write them a check. We have to get them to perform. And so it's like, it, it's interesting because I just think in our space, like culture is just, it's not, an, it's not an option. Like for us to go bring on new talent, we have to constantly be going in. I don't even, it's funny. We don't even, I wouldn't even say like, we feel like we're great at it. It's just, we have like two product offerings. One is Vivint to the customer and then I teach our leadership, but our real product is actually our program and our organization to our develop, to our reps. And that's our most important product. Like Vivint's taking care of the product development there and innovation. Like if we're not disrupting and innovating as much as Vivint is disrupting and innovating the smart home market, like we're gonna lose. Like we have to be, that's why personal finance and our investing and like we go so heavy on that because it's such a piece that kids want and the emotional side and we try to, you know, add all these ancillary pieces that is almost like a men's group that you sign up for. Which I feel like also like-minded people gravitate like-minded people. For sure. To where it's, we've been talking about, like we want to start a sales side. Like we've been fortunate enough to this point, MMG hasn't had to do sales. Like when I, when we started this, I thought it was going to be like busting business doors and everything. And then I'm like, we kind of proved our concept online and it's been, we engineered exactly what we pitched to clients. We engineered it for ourselves to where it's like, yeah, it's great. And that keeps building larger and larger and larger, but it's, I look at it as we're doing a disservice because we could be going twice as fast mm. if we put a sales team on the ground, but it's, it's something starting from zero that it is coming into a, salary and commission based group that I want the rock star that's going to come in and bet on themselves a hundred percent. Like 
that salesperson is going to kill it, but it's also a very unique space that B2B business sales is completely different. Yeah. That it was something that it took me a little while to adapt to. That I was used to the car space, getting the yes there, like getting people shaking their head up and down with you, like progressing forward through the car deal. Like I knew a car deal inside and out on how to sell people. And it's like, l- luckily in the car space, I was really good at the rapport building, building the relationships with people. And so with the B2B side, it wasn't always yeses at that time. And I felt like in the be- beginning, I was like failing because I wasn't getting a yes every time. But in the business side, they may have two other partners that they have to talk with. That's a non-negotiable. And it's like, you press them too hard, you're gonna get a definite no. But it's like, so all of a sudden I, I had meetings, I had meetings, I'm like, I'm coming back, I'm like, I fucking suck. And I'm like, <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't have this sales ability I thought I had. And then like two, three months later, people are messaging, sending us emails like, hey, we like to get rolling, when can we onboard? And I was like, well, this is weird. Cause like in the car business, we always made fun of like, if somebody left sales guys, like, Oh, they're coming back. Callbacks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. I'll hold my breath. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, they'll, they'll be right back on the be back bus. But, and it's, it, it, it's a whole different space that I, it's something right now. I don't know how to find that B2B salesperson that we're looking for. You know what I think? Um, cause in our space, dude, and I think every sales, I think it's, you know, direct to consumer, B2B. I don't think it matters what it is. Sales to me is like a whole nother language. And each industry probably has its own dialect. And I think the best sales reps, right? Like we have a lot of guys that are really, really successful, but most people are never as good as our veterans, or our managers. Like it takes time. And part of our, like what you just talked about culture, we do a, a lot to help people understand, look, if you're gonna step into this arena to go play at the highest level and you wanna perform against the highest level people, like you need to one, respect all the dues that they've paid and two, expect to freaking pay the same ones. And so I think what's cool about sales and the misconception that people have is you're either a salesperson or not because they see what great salespeople can make and they're just like, oh, he's a freak. And it feels like a shortcut. That's what I hear people describe it all the time. Like, oh, it's a shortcut. You can make this amount of money in that amount of time. But the reality is it's not a shortcut in the time that you can get to the income. It's a shortcut and it's one of the only industries that allows you to compress effort into time. They allow you to put more effort into the same amount of time that a normal job just doesn't allow you to do. You show up nine to five, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like you got 10 years until you have an opportunity for this position. But if you're willing to work nights, study mornings, run your pitch more, run role plays more, you're willing to do 10 times more in the same amount of time, you get 10 times the results. And it's like painful for a season until you figure it out. But like in your space, I just think the only way to build, like find great, true, loyal sales reps, because that's another thing in the sales industry, most of them are mercenaries. Like you want you want a loyal like partner, you gotta build them in my opinion. And then they just have to understand, like they have to catch the vision of like what the long play is. Like they have to be infinite minded because it's just that three to six month period in any new industry is a learning curve. You learn new mm-hmm. language, like yeah, speak it for a while. And that's, I've became better and better as I've progressed in the marketing space. I, I understand what I'm talking about to where it's, it's a whole different ball game now, but it's positioned us in rooms that are, I mean, we're sitting at tables 10 times the size we were in the beginning. And it's, we go from in the beginning, I mean, single to two digit accounts to now we're closing six figure accounts a month. That's sick. That it's a, a huge progression, but it's like, I remember when when we closed that, that first one that I'm driving there and I'm like, is this like, is this real? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm calling Mass. I'm like on the phone and before I get there and I had, I was so nervous like all day, like all day. My, it was just like inside. I had this, like my stomach was tight and I'm like, and it, I don't even know why. Like, and finally I called her. I was like, I came to peace if I don't get it. And she goes, what do you mean? She goes, you're going to get it. I was like, no, but I've came to peace that like, we've done what we're supposed to, to position ourselves at this table. I know that speaks volumes that we even had a chance to have a seat. Yeah. Got to pitch. Yeah. And it was like, and then we get the account and I'm like, she's like, see, I told you. And like, she didn't even <laughs> guess twice about it. But it's like on that, that sales front of like knowing that, that language and knowing how to progress into it. And 
it's hard a lot of times on vision because I'm such a fast paced runner that you can ask everyone around us. Like, I mean, three year growth has been crazy for us, but it's still not as fast as I want it to be. Like I am so impatient with everything that it's like, I have the fancy factory vision like it. And it's like, oh, it, dude. I empathize it, with it, that so much. My, <laughs> sometimes my reps will be like, dude, if I can get to where you're at, pinnacle of life i'm like i got shit dude we, we're not we're not even playing the game yet dude like we don't have a jet we're not freaking doing shit like you, we gotta go faster and that's what like you're looking at the like you're looking at where you even start competing like yeah. the ring that i'm stepping in i haven't got close to stepping into it yet like i haven't even started competing with where i, I want to be yeah and it's like but that's what fuels that every day when they're like what motivates you when you get up every day like get to the fucking arena and like you're playing in one that's over here, but it's not the one I want to be in. And it's like, so you keep, you keep doing that. And like, it's hard a lot of times when you're telling people that vision, like I, I remember in the beginning, like when we even talked about a podcast, when we even talked about half the shit that we do now and they're like, yeah, okay. And then I'm like, motherfuckers watch. And I'm like, <laughs> and then you keep progressing, you keep doing it. And guess what? Everyone watches and only one out of 10 people watching actually is there for you to succeed. Nine of them are just watching to see you fall. They want to watch the fall and it's like, keep watching because you're not going to catch it. And it's like, so when you tell people a lot of times that vision that are, they can't wrap their mind around it. It's, they think you're full of shit, but it's like, we talk about the jets. We talk about all these things. And it's like, I, I look at it as our progression level over. If you came to me and you're like, dude, next two years, I'm buying a jet. I'd be like, fuck yeah, you are. Give you next, I'm like, I better be on the first ride. Like, you better but, scoop me up. But it's like, and I, I'm gonna tell you, like, hey, we're coming right behind you. Like, we're gonna be flying those one and two. Like, but it's most people can never even wrap their mind around that lifestyle. And like, we've sat at tables with guys that all have jets, yeah. and I'm like, they're just like us. They just figured out a way to be a little bit smarter, more efficient with their time, and scale something faster. I'm done a little longer. Yeah, that that's a piece that I've had to like. It's funny. I I talked to my dad. You know, he been really really successful. He's done the jet. Like he's he's played the PG level. And dude, I'm like, bro, frick, man, I'm not getting anywhere. And you know, he sits me down. He's like, he's 56, whatever. He's like, bro, dude, look, I know a hundred guys that have what you're trying to get. Like, dude, just keep doing it. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard for for guys like us, especially myself, because I want to like compete with them today. But I have to remind myself when I'm looking at the kid who like wants what I have in half the time. Like you got to respect the steps that they paid along the way. And there's like Ryan said earlier, dude, consistency is so powerful. That compounding effort of just like you might not be great today. Like this podcast is so amazing from the first time and just doing them over and over and over and over and over again. Like. When you look back, you're like, holy crap, dude. The first intro I've ever you guys had was freaking hilarious. It was Dane, it was Dane, it was Dane reading it. He's like, welcome wow. to the MMG podcast. <laughs> wow, put me on blast. No, like no. But like from a from a super hopeful standpoint is what's so cool. Is like now you have this thing dialed. You guys have had on amazing guests. You've created amazing relationships and like you guys are winning a podcast. And it was just literally the consistent play of like, you guys just kept attacking it. But that's just everything. And some of these big goals we have, I mean, dude, there, there's... There's a reason people aren't CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. The average age of CEO of Fortune 500 is 55. Yeah. Because it takes a lot of experience, man. Like you got to kind of get your teeth kicked in a couple of times before people trust you enough. And it's like, I don't know. I feel that there there is the time to pay. And it's, it's hard. It's really hard. But it's also, I've became very, very much in tune with enjoying the, the journey to yeah. get there. <laughs> that I lost sight of that for a while. And we just had a talk this week at the office about doing more stuff as a company together. 2024, that's like one of my main goals that like this year's goal, I came out the gate, it was all finance. Like it was so dialed on like this scale of just pure growth. And it was like kind of the same thing when I took a step back to start fixing myself, it was amazing how fast the company started changing. And then I was like, it took me this long to then say like, what if we start focusing on changing that culture even more and setting that standard even higher that it's like, it's going to multiply even faster and it's going to create higher energy levels for the people that are there, the higher production levels, like all of it chases right behind it to where it's like, 
my goals coming out for 2024 are so different than what 2023 was. Yeah. But it's more of a, this is what we need to do as a company to change the people's lives that are inside of it. And I think that's kind of like the maturing and growing is in the beginning, you're so hungry for the money and the money is the money's the jet, the money's the cars, the money's the watches, the money's the all that shit. That's like you chase, you chase, you chase. And it's like uh, David or Patrick Bet David has that, uh, was it the next five moves or whatever? Yeah, his book. So he talks about your very bottom of the, the pyramid is your um, survival. And that's like where I feel like a lot of people start off in business. That's where people come out and they're chasing the status level. It's like, I, w- I want the car, I want the house, I want the, the, the watch, I want all these material things. And they catch up to status. And then most people never get outside of status. But then you move up to, f- to freedom. That's figuring out how to leverage your time, really figuring out how to manage your life and not be strapped to money. That money isn't going to make you happy somewhere. Anyone that thinks that they're going to go make a make more money next year and that's going to find them happiness, I promise you that will not. To where, and then he talks about once you you get over freedom, you get to purpose. And really finding out like what your purpose is. And it's funny, once I found the – I saw the freedom level when I went to a buddy's wedding in Mexico. It was the first time that MMG ran and operated without me inside of it at all. That was like, it was the first time I sat there like on a trip that I was like, not stressed out. Yeah. Not like the whole thing's going to burn to the fucking ground because I'm gone. And I was like, whoa. I was like, this is what freedom looks like. But then it made me come back and like I reverted straight back to that that pyramid that I'm like, and now I'm on to purpose. I'm like, <laughs> what is my purpose? Like, how can I make everyone better inside of here? And it was like, it shifted so fast that this time it wasn't to a status level. It was to overall purpose of the company. Yeah. I, you know, I was talking with, uh, Jeremy Gabbert. Oh yeah. Who's a uh, really bummed that I missed him. Yeah. When he came to the he's, office. He's a, he's a really cool guy. I'm actually going to go out and, uh, go to one of their events in February. Um, but, uh, you need to go. When is it? Uh, I gotta get the dates, but it's like their nine figure boardroom. So the dates. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, it'd, be, it'd be fun. That would be. It's in Scottsdale. But, uh, you know, he was talking about, you know, he works for, arguably the most successful people in the entrepreneurial space of all time. Like Grant yeah. Cardone's an apex predator, right? Dean Graziosi is like one of the best in the education space. And, you know, he just, he said this and I really, really empathize with this. Like, dude, money gets a lot of people in the game. Um, but when you hit a certain point in, you know, whatever the number is, 250, 300 grand, whatever, like, then then you really do need other stuff. Like you got to bolt on ancillary reasons. And, you know, I remember the first time I got a six figure check, like personal income, six figure, hit the bank account in a day. And like, dude, nothing happened. I know your world, like whole thing's supposed yeah. to be like, there was no confetti. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. like no, nobody knew about it, but me. Right. And like, I wasn't married at the time. So it was like, it was a silent celebration. When I'm going to go tell my homies, look, I made a lot of money. Like, no, you like, think dude, you're going to like walk different. You think like you're, you think that when that happens, all of a sudden, like all those problems that you have are like gone. It, they're still right there. They're, yeah. they're, they're no different. <laughs> And it's just interesting because, you know, we talk about this, we sit down with kids all the time and they're like, man, I want to retire at 30. And I'm just like, I, I feel bad that like that belief has been permeated because we're not good people to be idle. Like we're supposed to just develop and play the game. And like that, that's mortality that we're just supposed to keep progressing. And what money is, and Jeremy talked about this is it's, it's just a scorecard. It's just to know where are your passion products? Like how, how good are you doing at it? Like, are you effective? Is it, is it working? Are you touching people's lives? Because if you're not selling stuff and the product or the service isn't winning, then you're not delivering value to people. And if you can't keep your employees in the company, you can't be profitable and you can't turn it over, like then you're not delivering value and fulfillment to your employees. Like really profitable companies have really good employees that love their job and love the mission. And they have great products that people are obsessed about and like believe in the mission or the value behind the product. And at the end of the day, like, when you're chasing that, the, the money's just a byproduct to know like, hey, we're really fulfilling our mission here. Like we're winning. And, and Ryan, I talk about this all the time, like the money, right? Like, and don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't know that there's ever a point where like, there isn't some motivation in the money. Like it, it's cool to do new things, but like 
it doesn't change everything. I give up a lot of income opportunities to develop other people and just like move the needle of an organization. And like when you talk about these people want to retire at 30, like for what? That's the point, yeah. Like what do you do at 30? So say say you do make enough money to retire at 30. What, what are you going to do? You know where I think that comes from? I was actually thinking about this the other day. I like, think that whole phrase comes from like two generations ago, people worked the same stinking job they hate till they're like 65. And they just think about, what if I could have got out of this shit 35 years earlier? <laughs> yeah. But like people who like their life, like I don't want to end my life at 35 and just play golf and go to the lake. Like I'd be freaking miserable. It'd be cool for like maybe a couple of weeks. Like, trust me. I, I I've got eight <laughs> months off every year, dude. Like I'm trying to stay <laughs> busy, I promise. Like I don't need freaking but years. I feel like they, they mean freedom. I, I don't know if they just want to sit and twiddle their thumbs all day, but like the option to continue to work or, hey, I don't want to show up today. You guys got it because like the freedom, I think, is more sexy. And if you actually like talk to a kid that said that and be like, hey, wait, 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 what are you talking about? What does that look like? Yeah, they would probably that. say, I just want to be able to choose if I want to or not or what I want to do, which I think is different. But with our flexibility, what we do, it's. That's kind of like what it is. So that's where I, I think people can find that in a lot of industries. Like I was actually talking to two guys at MMG this week about it on when it gets nice out. Like I don't mind if they if their stuff is getting done, which it's a give and take deal that there's certain people that aren't mature enough to do it yet that have to earn that spot. But it's there's certain individuals that I have that I'm like, hey, if you want to put in a late evening, and maybe early morning so you can leave and go play golf at noon on a Wednesday. Cool. Like, but it's, you hit, you hit that right on. Like they want freedom and they watched their parents work till they were 65 on an assembly line doing the same shit their whole entire life. And they're like, that's not what I want to where they think that it's, they have to do something crazy different, but it's also on the, the forefront that I love going to work. I absolutely like can't wait every day to go into work. Like the people that are there, like everything about it, it just like I enjoy every minute. And it's like the journey, the the growth, the everyone's elevating and moving that needle forward every day that we show up. When you treat your guys like adults with that freedom and that trust, I think they perform better anyway. Yeah, like a perfect example. And he tells the story a lot. But my first day on the job, I went out there <laughs> freaking out. All right. This is my first day on the doors. He's like, yeah, come on right with me. Let's, let's uh, we'll talk pitch, work on our whatever we're doing on the way out to area. I was like, well, I, I kind of need to ride by myself. Like, I'm going to drive myself out so I can focus on what I've been learning, focus on everything. He's like, well, we kind of never let rookies go out by themselves. They're just going to sit on the curb and not work all day. <laughs> but he trusted me enough. I, granted, I'm an older rookie than normal, but he trusted me enough to feel for me. He was like, all right, well, let, we'll, we'll try it out. You drive out there. See if you're like 90% of the rookies that I'm used to who are just going to go to the park and just. He's just times. jamming a Taylor Swift player <laughs> the whole drive. <laughs> but I ended up like getting out. Like I, I there's no question in my mind that I was going to do what I needed to do. But like for him to trust me to do what I need to do, I got out there and I got into a couple homes, got my first deal on the first day and. But without that, I it would be tough for me to do. Just so, I needed that. And it's also unique in, and this is why it happens in the car space, where sales guys are given freedom on what they do every day. And you have some guys that go in and they excel, and then you have some guys that just drop off because they're not held to what they have to do. And it's hard sometimes, like, I mean, it's something we navigate all the time with. You have salary employees that they'll sit there and play on their phone all day if you gave them options. Oh, yeah. That it's like not everyone's driven the same way to and I don't expect people to come in off the street and day one be sold on the vision. That yeah, once again, they believe that I believe it, but it's like they have to become bought in at some point. And when they get bought in, it's amazing how fast you see people change. That all of a sudden then they can be that person that can have some freedom, but they still at the beginning of the day they get up with that vision in mind. Like I, I can see it clear as day. That's why I love going to work every day. That's what like drives me. I can't wait till one day down the road when we have this fancy factory that everyone's rolling into and stuff in the morning. It's like, 
clients are coming by. We have a full till barbershop. Hair is getting cut all the time. Like, and it's funny because people come in right now. They're like, dude, this is next level. I'm like, that's the like current standard. Like, that's not the standard we're it's chasing. Like the first level. Yeah. I'm like, we're on level one. Like, no one here has made it to level two. I'm like, we're going to level 10. But it's like, that's what you're you're watching. But it's, that freedom is a huge part of it. And it's, it, it, it is hard trusting people when sometimes you give them a little trust and then they, they neglect it really quickly. Then it's like, it's really hard to gain that back. So that's, and uh, on a hundred percent commission based job, it's like, hey, you go out, you didn't sell shit, you gotta get paid shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, the destiny, your destiny's in your hands when you go out. So Yeah, I it's interesting. I've just seven years of building teams and and running the operation, like you how much how much I've learned about people, who who to play with and who doesn't deserve an opportunity. And I've definitely like made a lot of mistakes. And Ryan's actually been like, even this last year, like I think a lot of people came to the team. They're like, man, you really haven't figured out and how much we're changing still. Like we're still carving away. And it's just, you never figure it all out. And like, I just don't think that's business. I don't think it's life. Like there's never a point where your marriage is all of a sudden just like, oh man, we are just euphoric and it's just amazing every day. And it's just, <laughs> it just always takes effort. Well, and that's what Hermosi says, right? It's like, it's not a, it's not a finite game. Yeah. Like the point of the the point of the game is to continue to play. Like you to don't just win marriage. Yeah. It's not like you have yeah. such a good date night that it's like, oh, check it off. Don't have to worry about that. The rest of my life, we're yep. good to go. I love that. He he talks about the journey all the time. And he said he had a post, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he's like, if you knew that one hundred percent you were going to get the outcome that you wanted, would it even worth be doing in the first place? The whole point of it is the unknown, not knowing if you're going to get it. The rush of trying so hard, failing over and over and over again until one day you might get it. But if you already knew that you were going to get it, I don't even know if it'd be worth doing in the first place. So like looking at that when you're in like hard times or just like being grateful for the journey that you're on, you can still have goals down the road like the Fantasy Factory. And then we have our office right now in Kansas City, but there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to grow into something bigger empire have a spot downtown and have a spot dominating the entire city of kansas city having multiple in different cities across america but like enjoying the journey again not knowing if we're even going to get there but that's why we do it the whole journey is the whole part we're, we're gonna be on the same plot of land. i don't hey. know what i just walked in but you said i don't know if i'm going to get there we're gonna have there's gonna be MG what, what was that vivid i'm down <laughs> We're gonna have a, a sister, we're just gonna have a giant compound. We'll have one of the big catwalks across the top. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll, we'll all the reps will come over and do all their content. Yeah. And then we'll have sales meeting and it just comes right back <laughs> over. Yeah, you guys can train our sales department. <laughs> exactly. It'll be you sick. Put it yeah. in one pocket and we'll yeah, we'll I think just, they, uh, there'll be a mutual weight room yeah, that so, just like spans like Alpha, so Alpha Gym in Texas. I mean, you guys have some time off during the year, right? This is true. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's you guys it. could just become the MMG sales <laughs> We just We just need that a little bit. Yeah. There just we go. We just solved our whole problem. Mercenary squad. Yeah. <laughs> Contract kill us. You guys are going to be like, wow, this is pretty easy to sell too. <laughs> Dude, it's it's funny. I've I've actually, for my dad's sales floor, for his company, um, most of what they do is like webinars. So they don't really have a set. They do like one to many sales. They like have a special really good speaker that can do a one to many presentation, but they still have all these leads that come in and, you know, they start bringing a sales floor back. And I've had a couple reps that have just, you know, for whatever personal reasons, the, the model just doesn't fit them anymore. And now they, they work, I've helped them get a job with my dad. And he's like, dude, I don't know what it is about these freaking door door guys, man. They kick ass over here. And I'm <laughs> like, dude, if you put, I'm like, listen, dude, I literally have like a 95% close rate. If I step inside the house, like legitimately, if if they let me through the threshold of that door, it's pretty much daggum willing that that thing's going in. I mean, in this room, I think he's batting it. I think he's got us all. Yeah, 100% in this room. <laughs> I did notice the vivid on the yeah. house. Yeah. That and was like, Tyler. I'm like, dude, if somebody knew I was coming, like call him like, dude. We're, we're he really? did that, then he got me to take him out to Capitol. Yeah. yeah. What a close. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. We, You know, we're, we spend some money, uh, get him some clients. We. I try to get everybody I talk to to use MMG. Hey, I love it. I love it. Because when we have the compound, I mean. Huh? Anyone that buys a house, we can always refer you. That's right. Uh, 
Ryan's got Vivian all over his crib. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got way off track after I went to the bathroom. <laughs> it's pretty dialed there for a minute. Um, where do you see? I don't, and I may have missed what you guys were talking about when I was gone for like 12 and a half minutes going to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, where do you see like, so Vivint right now, you guys are traveling all over to sell. So is, do you guys, so you hub out of Kansas city? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting model. So we, we develop our work, like our team out of KC. Um, and then during our off season, we, we go test markets. And so we go train new reps and kind of basically try out reps until the summer. And in the summer, Vivint covers our housing. They take care of all the logistics and they house us up. And so we've ran Chicago the last three years and just dominated that market. And it's possible we'll probably go back to Chicago. But down the road, vision wise, I think to your question, what we see, like we talk about this a lot, it, it, we want to build the largest decentralized office at Vivint. So it's there's a hub in Salt Lake that's about probably 80% of the teams at Vivint. They're all reps from that area. And then there's one in Florida and it's probably like, it might even be bigger. It might be like 40% now. They're, the Florida team is killing it. They did like 80,000 accounts last year. They have, Damn. you know, five guys that made a million and a half bucks. One dude made six. Like, and what's cool about that, just like everything we talked about, it's not about the money. It's just like when, when the lid goes that high, it just provides that many opportunities for everyone else that has a dream to go fulfill their dream in whatever capacity and whatever level it is inside of it. And for us, like, our, our pipe dream and like what we're chasing, we truly believe we can do is because we have the ability to employ so many people and teach such a level skill set. Like we want to completely change like Kansas City where in Utah, like if you go to college at one of those schools out there, like, dude, there's pretty much a 90% chance at some point you will go work for Vivint or try it out and develop yourself, whether you do it for years or you use that to cater to your next ability. Like we want to raise the standard by giving so many more people opportunities to develop the skill set and leverage it either in Vivint or go on to, you know, dominate their next venture. And that's, uh, I've talked about on the podcast a hundred times. I think people should be required to go into sales. I mean, people go in and I mean, we've had all kinds of fuss lately on us saying stuff about college degrees that <laughs> people come out of the woodwork, get all bent out of shape about it, which is kind of funny because most of the time people get really defensive when they're wrong. So it's like, I've had very level headed conversations with people and it's like, the skill set that someone can learn in sales and how many different areas it can be used in. And also it doesn't take you four years to become great at sales. You talk about how, I'll take that back. Some people it may take that long, but it's also, you talk about how much you can compress into it. That when I came out the gate selling cars, I was not good. And I literally thought like, dad owns a dealership, I'm gonna be great at this. And I like, I was ready. I go on the sales floor and out the gate, everyone's telling me no. I'm like, maybe I'm not so good at this. <laughs> and there for a little bit, I was like, maybe just sales isn't my thing. And my dad's like, you are not quitting. He goes, you figure out how to become good at this. So I start taking every bit of Grant Cardone's training. Then I'm in every bit of Joe Verde's training. I'm going through all this different sales training. And I'm like trying these word tracks. I'm like, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. And I'm like, I suck at building rapport. And then I'm like, I started becoming better at that. And in the beginning, the one thing that took me the longest to figure out and realize was how to listen to people. That when I first got into sales for the longest time, I was like thinking about what I was gonna say. I was predicting what someone was gonna say to me. And if I can give anybody a word of advice in sales, they can move you forward so much quicker is learn how to listen faster that don't think about what you're going to say. I even did when we started the podcast. Like when we first started the podcast, I'm like, I gotta think about what they're saying so I know what to say back. And then somebody would stop and I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I was like, I wasn't listening to what they said. I don't know what to say back. So it's like, you're, you're processing that in your head. And it's like, once I started figuring out how to listen to people, it was crazy how much easier sales got. I'm like, oh, I actually know what I'm overcoming now. Like, I actually know how to solve this. I'm like, I've seen this happen before. I'm like, this is what I need to do. And like, and I started like figuring it out and I was like, okay, this isn't that hard. But in the beginning I made it so hard because I let those no's stack up and affect me emotionally and mentally. And it's also, I wasn't listening to people that 
you start listening to people, they're going to tell you exactly how to close. Yeah. I, one of the, we talked about this with, with our team and we, we've been doing more on it, but one of the, so Ryan was just one of our, he was our top record in our team. He's top record in our program ever. And one of the things that we identify really quickly. And I, I told Ryan about, he, he brought a guy on and I, you know, the first day I was like, this dude's going to suck. He's like, how do you know? I'm like, well, I dropped him off and he just walked laps around, like didn't touch a door ever. Just pulled out his iPad. He was like so scared. He, could, he barely get out of my flipping car. I'm like, all right, dude, get out of the car. <laughs> like, I gotta go. But Ryan, like the second he had the chance, like door, 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 no idea what he's doing. And it really is in sales, like, just like in basketball or football or any sport, dude, like you can watch film as much as you freaking want. If you want to have a smooth crossover, you got to rep it hundreds of thousands of times. Like if you want to know how to read a defense and you're a safety, like you got to see the offense play a lot and you got to real time go and make decisions until it's fluid and it becomes instinctive. You want to get good at podcasts. You want to get good. Like you got to have a lot of conversations where you find your authentic voice. You find out like what you want to say to people and like, what are the things you're not scared to say? Sales, same thing. Like, you want to get good, you've got to get at bats quick. And you got to be, you got to give zeros about the result because everyone's so scared about like, what if I miss the deal? What if I mess it up? Bro, we're not running out of people to talk to. Yeah. Like, Guess what? If you didn't knock the door at all, there was an opportunity you never zero, got anyway. Zero. Still yeah. a zero. <laughs> well, my biggest thing, and I don't know if you guys feel the same as me because I'm mean, at this table, a lot of successful people, but the fear of failure to me is I just, I don't, for whatever reason, I don't have it. I like failing because it's like a gauge of where I'm at so I can correct it and then keep going. So I think a lot of people that are kind of scared to fail almost act too cool for school because they don't even want to try it to begin with. Because what if I fail? Then I can't live with myself or I can't look at myself because I'll have to admit that I tried my hardest and didn't get to where I thought I could. But I, I don't know for whatever reason, it's really easy for me to just go out there and fail. And I would argue the reason that I succeed in a lot of things pretty quickly is because I do fail so often. So then I can learn, correct things, and then become good at it. Because I think failure is like the first step into becoming next level of good. And people that are scared to even get in that in the first place don't know what the next level is. And I used to like try to, I don't know, kind of, I would look at fear as failure. Fear is not failure. That is, I I look at, or I look at failures as like being fearful of those, which I've, I look at it now as those are lessons that we're learning to progress forward. Oh yeah. That no one that you know, there's not a single human being out there that has made a perfect decision every single time they ever made decisions. You're not going to meet that person. I'm not even sure if this fast is a good idea. But we're, <laughs> we're deep, dude. I mean, I can say that was probably a bad idea, but whatever, that's, <laughs> that's just me. Uh, but when you look at it as I used to, in the beginning, I was, I don't want to say I was fearful, but I thought those like small decisions had most of the time, those small decisions, the, the impact is a lot smaller than what you think. So if you go mess up that one sale at that one door and that one person says, no, they think that's a, that's like a, a landslide to what's going on. Like, and when I started first making phone calls in the dealership, like I didn't get leads, like I'm the owner's son, so I didn't get any leads. And I'm like, what, what do I do? They're like, well, we have 8,000 people in our CRM that from the last four years, you can go call those people. So I'm calling people that have no interest in a car. Like they are not in market, it is not a hot lead, it is as cold as possible. And they're calling, they're like, uh, who is this? And people are like, fuck you, like hanging up, hanging up, hanging up, and I'm like, I go in my dad's office like first day. It's like noon. I'm like, dad, I don't like this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, this is not cool. I'm like, not cool at all. And the whole time I watch from the outside of these people just selling cars, like making it happen. They're getting good checks. I'm like, this is this is what I'm going to do. And I'm like, this isn't what I'm doing. And he's like, no, you'll, you you guys, you need to learn that side of it. So I'm sitting there and b b just one time after another, after another, after another. But during those, all of a sudden, after I don't know, probably like fifty times of people hanging up, I'm like, I gotta come, I gotta come at this differently. I was like, so then I, I started figuring out my own work track, just try to keep someone on the phone. Yep. And I'm like, hey, can I interest you in an oil change? 
And they're like, what? And I'm like, hey, at least they stay on the phone. They didn't say no. Yeah. They, they didn't cuss at me. I'm like, I'm doing good. I got a what? <laughs> like, Dude. So it was just like those small things I started tweeting. Did yeah. it give me cardio? Absolutely not. But I'm like, I figured out how to keep someone on the phone longer. Yeah. I figured out how to even start having a conversation. And then I'd sit there and have conversation with people like 30, 45 minutes. And my dad's like, what are you doing? I was like, he's like, you sell that? I'm like, no. Nah. But I know their kids' names now. I know <laughs> like everything about them. And I was like, they said they might be interested in a car in like six months. I don't know how to sell yet, but I know how to keep a conversation. That's good. Towards like just that progression that it wasn't failures. Because those 30, 45 minute <laughs> conversations I had were, were teaching me something on how to sell in the future. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I feel like school maybe a little bit just conditions us because – you know, school is so test weighted and, and it really is like your whole life, elementary, and, and it makes sense. There has to be some way to measure efficacy, but your whole life, you go into these situations where you study, 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 and you get one chance to take the test. And a lot of your like future academic success or opportunities based on how you perform in these tests. But life and business is like totally flipped. It's like, yeah. dude, go take the test, which is pitch the real person, come back and realize like, oh, Questions one through three, I just got the answers to. Now I'm going to go take the test again, but I've already got one through three, so I just need four, five, and six now. And then when I get four, five, and six, I'm going to go get six, seven, eight, nine. And like that's that's what real life is. And that's what business is. Like take the test, find out. Over oh, I got a couple more couple over. more questions that I didn't even know existed on the test. I don't even know how long the test is. <laughs> oh, there's is. a second page? Yeah, there's a second page. Oh, oh, shit. shit. <laughs> like, oh, there's a, ah, oh, frick, dude, this was multiple choice. This would fill in the essay. Like, crap. And But like that's real life. And when you can condition yourself, like I'm willing to take a test, not from the essence of like, I'm going to fail, but like, I just need to know what's even on the test so I can go back and study. That's like a really powerful way to operate. Yeah. And I always thought too, I was going to be like, in the beginning, I was so worried about objections because that was like something in sales that's just like press on everyone, like overcoming objections, overcoming objections. And, and they're like, every objection is different. I'm like, how the heck am I supposed to know how to overcome them all then? <laughs> and then you, you sit there and in the beginning, you're just like, just rattled like every single time someone was like, uh, I don't like the way the driver's seat works. Hold on. Let me go talk to my manager. I'll be right back. And you have like no earthly idea. I'm like, uh, they don't like the driver's seat. <laughs> so it's like, uh, what'd you say? Yeah. I told uh, him I was going to ask you. I was going to come talk. <laughs> right. You wouldn't even be surprised. You know how many times I've got a phone call of a rep in the house? Uh, he says he doesn't want a camera on back. So don't do it. <laughs> what? <laughs> but I talked about one on the back. Well, tell him he doesn't need one. I, what do you want? I, what, what are you calling me for? Like, are you in the house? Yeah, I'm in the house. Are they sitting across the table from you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you on the phone with me? <laughs> Send me a pin. I'm coming over. But it's like, it's it's funny when those like objections start happening that then fast forward X amount of years, I'm sitting in the management spot and I have a new sales guy that's coming in like doing the same shit. I'm like, are you serious? Are you serious right now? But it's like, they're freaking out because every objection that they're getting, they're like, I, they have no earthly idea how to overcome it. And I'm like, just tell them we'll fix whatever it is that they don't like. Like, Lily, if there's anything wrong with the car, I'm like, if you ever came in here and we not fixed anything, they're like, um, yeah. If we so, couldn't fix it, it wouldn't be on the lot. Exactly. And I'm like, so, yeah. They're like, well, there's a scratch on the bumper they're pretty concerned about. I'm like, tell them we'll fix it. Oh, okay. And I'm like, which, granted, I mean, our, our salespeople that we had could pretty easy to sell. Like they didn't have to sell around things. When I was selling, we had some pretty shitty cars in the beginning. Now I'm like broke down on the side of the road. I'm like, so if we get this fixed, when we get back, we're like, we in. <laughs> and they're like, well, what do you think it is? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm not a mechanic. I'm like, we, we can be on gas for all I know. <laughs> and I remember coming back and like cars being pulled into service and everything. I'm like, yeah, we're getting docs ready. We're papering on a deal. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever it is, we'll fix it. Like we'll make it right. But it's, I don't know what it is, but it's, it was crazy, like in the the time that I learned to sell, and just in the progression of to the salespeople we had, that there's some guys from the car business that saw things back in the day that, I mean, they're they're probably watching this and they're laughing like, yeah, he doesn't know shit. Like <laughs> they did it years before that was a, a whole different level before the internet. Dude, that, it's it's funny too as you as you manage up. I I tell Ryan and some of the other guys that are like developing their career i'm like look i honestly need you for the new talent because i'm like seasoned enough that there's a lot of stuff that i just miss 
because it's so second nature to me at this point after hundreds of deals that I've done and so many repetitions, like a little cue thing that I realized that I taught to them that like isn't as noticeable to me because I'm just like, dude, you're so far off. Like, where are we even freaking start? <laughs> yeah. Because to me, I'm like, dude, how do you not know your tone? You're not standing too far enough back. Like your question's weird. Like what the hell are you talking about? But it's, I think that's like, you always, like we talk about, we always have to be developing new talent. I think it's like, like the NBA, the NFL, the MLB, every major high performing organization is bringing in a, a, a talented rookie class every year. It's because like, that's how you keep your leadership sharp. Like you've got to have a teaching and a learning and an executing leg. Yeah. Like Ryan right now is probably honestly better in, it, there's some technical things that still I teach to the team a lot on, but like, there's a lot of things that Ryan remembers because the sting of the rookie year is still there. Was three months ago. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, to me, I'm like, oh dude, 68 counts. Frick, I did that in a month once. Like, wait, you, tra you trying to figure out how to do it in a, in a summer? Like, <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> but it, it's, I mean, it's sharpening that iron with the iron that's around you. And it's, you guys have that talent that it is hard when you start gapping out. Like I sit there and I have no earthly idea how I'm going to hire a salesperson and even probably like communicate to teach them from ground zero on B2B sales. Like it's a hard space. Like it's something that when I stepped into it, I, I had a, a dominant sales background. I just had to fine tune how I did it. So it wasn't like I was learning a whole new skill set. Yeah. That it's you you have people that you get a mold into exactly what you want one time after another after another. After you know another. what's funny about that? One of the really cool part is so like all summer long we're immersed in the crafts. We're meeting every hour or like every day at noon for an hour on just learning how to sell better. And I have my guys, he has the whole team, whatever. We're, we're put into groups of our teams, but you'll like catch glimpses. Like I'll be pitching somebody in their living room and a little bit of Ty comes out of me because he's taught me how to sell. And a little bit of Luis will come out and then a little bit of Juan will come out. And like people's personality, you take bits and pieces from everybody that's kind of taught you before you and you use that. They're in your tool bag. You can pull them out and use them in certain instances. So now when I have my guys and I trained them a little bit last year towards the end and a little bit in this off season, it's like they're saying things, a little bit of Ryan in it, a little bit of Ryan here, a little bit of Ryan here. It's like, oh, that's me. You got that from me, didn't you? That was smooth. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. And it's, I feel like that makes great, great salespeople, great business people, whatever it is, is understanding where to take and where not to take that you're not going to look at Tyler like, oh, he is the perfect salesperson of every single thing he says is right. Right. But it's like I had great managers in the car business that I saw a lot of great characteristics that they had that I got to take. But then there are certain things that I didn't believe. I believe I could put my twist on it, make it a little bit better. Yeah. And it was I went through managers and then I had the luxury of I started buying all I started buying majority of our inventory. When I was buying inventory, I was getting to meet these different individuals at the sale and meet these dealership owners. And I'm down in Scottsdale with these dealership owners golfing. And it's like. I'm getting to learn like little pieces of things that they do and like how they're finding success over here. And it's like, they, they said this wasn't successful and I, I see the way they're doing this. I'm like, I, I don't fully agree with that. Like, and just kind of keeping that bird's eye view on everything that you're looking at to say, like, if I can take a little bit from everyone, I can build this. Like, I feel like that is pr why you found the success that you have Yeah, is being able to take a little bit from a lot and yeah, say, I've formed even, it into w what Ryan is now. Yeah. He's even got a story, he should share this. He he had like a week where he followed one of our VPs who's oh. historically been, he was a, a very, very dominant rep when he was still selling. And now he just is kind of executive management, but Ryan followed him and, yeah, you can tell it, but. Dude, I well, he's like a VP of our whole like region. So like millionaire coming in to speak with us for like a couple of days. He was in Chicago for like two, three days presented in front of everybody we're all hamming it up he's doing great stuff he's done done it for 17 years door to door so i'm taking notes i'm learning all this stuff i'm like oh okay that was good i feel like i'm really motivated to work he taps me on the shoulder after everybody's watching walking out he goes hey i'm gonna follow you today where are we going I'm like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> and so he meets me in my neighborhood we're getting out of the car i'm like okay this guy's been doing this for 17 years i don't know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for like three months. So I learn a shit ton of stuff, but I 
we halfway through, we flip it. So he's following me for the first hour. I follow him for the next, I made him do it for like an hour and a half, two hours, because I wanted to learn. But I picked up on his style, like he said, super bullish, super aggressive, like quick, 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 no nonsense, next door if they're not interested, next door. So I learned all this stuff, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna sell like Dorian now, his name's Aaron Doria. So <clears throat> the next day after he left, I'm like, all right, I'm in Dorian mode, let's go. I try to be exactly him, bagel, nothing, ass kicking, ass kicking, ass kicking the rest of the week. I'm like, okay, well, what's going on here? And I reflected back and I'm not him. There's no other tie, there's no other ride, there's no other and, there's no other one, whatever. It doesn't seem as authentic to the customer if you're not being your true self. So I was like, okay, that went way overboard. I tried to be Aaron here. I'm gonna tether it back and pick up on like two or three things that he does. But then the rest is Ryan. And then double digit week, 10, right off the bat. I was like, okay, this is where I need to stay. This this works for me. <laughs> this works a lot better. Yeah. And that's that's having that personality selling. Yeah. And I feel like people can read right through that when you're trying to be someone you're not. For sure. That I've I've been in dealerships, I've been all around a lot of salespeople and it's it almost makes me want to vomit when I start hearing them just like script through something. I'm like, what Andy Elliott just put that on Instagram like three days ago, or where'd you get that? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, whose course are you going through right now that you just pitched that? Because I am watching your weak ass and nothing like that's coming out your mouth. Yeah. And it's like there's a point when there's somebody that's that aggressive and that in your face that's like that over the top confident in what they're doing. When they say that, it flows right into it. That they can hit it without a even a millisecond hesitation. Yeah. And then you have somebody else like, <laughs> like trying to regurgitate Fumble. something. I'm like, like what? That didn't even make sense. And it's like you have to have that own style that you come up with selling. And that's yes. I feel like that's where the greats come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the the authentic energy is the most powerful thing you have. They've actually done studies on it. Like literally they've measured the energy like when you're in authentic state like you have the highest vibration frequency in your energy so and, it, and it's it's so real like people's biggest fear in sales or any business negotiates a fear of loss and when you're not authentic what people don't realize is even though you know your deal is still good the customer their fear of loss is triggered just because something's not right because you're not being you and it they, they, they go revert to the deal because that's what they're focused on. They're not really focused on you. They're focused on this opportunity or lack of opportunity to buy a product and whether it's a good deal or not. But that's the hardest thing for reps to understand is like, dude, when you get super scripted and you try to play a character, the customer isn't worried that the product or the offering isn't good. Like your uncertainty with yourself is causing uncertainty in the customer about your offer. It's like, you gotta figure your shit out. And that's in sales, I tell everyone I know, people buy from people. If you can understand that, you, sales will become a lot easier really fast. So people are so focused, like when I first started selling cars, I thought I had to know everything about cars. People are coming in, I'm like telling a bunch of random shit about cars that like, I barely even really knew. Like I just recently figured out on Google. <laughs> and it was like, they didn't care. And half the time they knew more about the car than I did. They're doing research to buy that particular car and it's like you watch these salespeople that I could probably go up and sell against some, some I'm not going to say Ryan, but like maybe some rookie that comes out the gate that doesn't really know what he's doing. I could go knock on some door and create some relationships that I'm like, tell me, give me a brief overview of the product. And I'll be able to go and create enough trust with that person quick enough that they're going to buy because your product's kit. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times people know what it is. It's not like you're selling some shit out of the back of a van that you're like, hey, yeah, that's pretty good. I know, no, yeah, I, knew, I know you've never heard of it before. <laughs> but it's like, you have a name behind it. So it's like, people know what it is. So it's like, you have so much traction already there. They go create the trust with the person with you. Product will sell itself every time. Like, I guarantee you Ty's not coming in, giving you a <coughs> breakdown of video feed. Like, no, and that, that's what's funny because you hit it right on the head. A lot of rookies, they're like, oh man, I just need to study my pitch and all the products before I go out today. I'm like, what? That's the stupidest thing I've yeah. ever heard. No, you're afraid to talk to people. Like, bro, listen, Ryan was selling. I was selling. Like, dude, my first day, I never shadowed. I didn't even know what we sold. I sold it in Spanish. Literally my first door ever. We knock. I'm supposed to be shadowing this guy. The lady opens up, little Mexican lady. She doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak Spanish. 
I'm like, well, frick, <laughs> I lived in Mexico. I don't know what the hell we sell, but I know I can probably get her to feed us because that was my go-to on the mission. When you're broke, you know how to get people to feed you. So I started vibing this lady, she gets it, we get inside. She starts making us tacos and I'm like, well, we have this doorbell camera thing. It's pretty freaking sick. This is like seven years ago, dude. She's like, yeah, we, we need that. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, hey dude, what do one of these things cost? It's like 75 bucks. Oh, okay. It's 75 bucks. You want to put it in? Like that was literally my clothes. It was terrible, but she bought, like we got it installed. And it, it, it's so, so true. Like if you have a real product and you have a real service, if you can just realize like, dude, your first and foremost responsibility is just connect that person to look at it. Like, you don't have to have all the answers. They don't even care. Like they really don't. We have so many rookies. I'm like, I get in the house. I'm like, how the hell did you get in here? <laughs> Cause they're just goobers. Yeah. And then they're in there and they're saying the craziest shit. I'm like, I would never say that, but I, I it's, it, <laughs> it's it, working it, for you. Yeah, it, 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 like, it like, it like builds so much confidence in me. Like, Oh, like dude, he's just being him. And like, these people are just vibing with it. And I'm like, that's amazing. Cause I would have never done this. I'd have been so uncomfortable if you'd have said something <laughs> like that in my house, dude. But that just is what it is. People know that they're being real. Yeah. And I think when you, you can implement that just time and time again. And it's, I don't know, I think people complicate sales so quickly. And if you keep it just stupid simple, people buy from people and get people like you. And that's being genuine too. Like if, I feel like I've been pretty good at reading people. Like I can tell if somebody just wants my, wants a sale from me or something and you people can read if you're desperate mm -hmm. and it's like when people get commission, sale, breath. Yep. commission breath and it's <laughs> you read it you could i spot it that fast and it's like it makes me literally to a point like even if i want what it is really bad i don't want to buy it from that person <laughs> <laughs> like i've literally had somebody knock at my door that was the most cringeworthy door sale that i still went with the product but i called to have somebody come out <laughs> that I'm like, this dude is not coming to my house. <laughs> I'm like, but it, it's, I don't, people know that they can read that. So it's like, how do you, how do you overcome that? Yeah, it's, dude, I, I mean, just that abundance mindset. That's probably one of the things that we talk about the most. Like, dude, if you're one, like finance, and we would, why we teach finances so much. Cause I, I genuinely believe when you're at a place of financial stability or security and you're like, you're living within your means, then you're not itching and you don't make stupid decisions. You don't say stupid stuff. Like you're just genuinely filling and living your purpose a little bit more. We're out there and it's like, I think this is where one of Ryan's secret weapons as a rookie was like, he really didn't care about money. Like he'd lived a happy life at $30,000 a year and was like, dude, I've, I'm chilling. Like I just need a bigger arena to go competing in. It wasn't even really the money. And so like the, that was just a byproduct, but so many people are chasing what they think that's going to give them. So they're so nervous, but when you have an abundance, like, dude, there's plenty of dollars in the world. Like it's going to come and go. There's more people to talk to. It's going to come and go. If it's not you, it's the next. Like if you can actually authentically believe, like it doesn't matter if you buy or not, like I'm, I'm going to sell to somebody today. So we're chilling. People feel that. And then they look at your offering very like objectively. But if they're like, dude, this kid's got, looks like he's got a lot to freaking lose. Like, what do <laughs> I not know? On? Like, he doesn't pay his rent if I don't get this. But like, what happens if I do? Like, <laughs> <laughs> How bad did he clobber me to pay his rent? <laughs> yeah, like, but that's real. Like, people feel that and they feel like, oh, like this dude does this all the time. He's not tripping. What is it you got? Like, they're almost more inquisitive. So, Ryan, mm -hmm. you being at what, 32? 33 now. 33 now? What made you want to take the step now? And to now, come to Vivint? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like you said, I've never been really like driven hard for money. I really enjoy being in the present moment as much as I can, relationships, being around like-minded people. But at the time, I mean, I was just bartending. And those weren't really like-minded people that I was around. I don't even drink. And I was selling drinks for six years and I'm sober. Like, I, I don't... I used to be a party boy back in college and that's why I'm not anymore. But I just, I'm huge into mindfulness and self growth and the mental aspect of life. And I was a college basketball player and I still play basketball to this day. And I'm super, super competitive, but I wasn't getting, getting that from work. So he played basketball in our league with us for like a year and a half before he even mentioned what he does for a living. I was like, wow, that was, that was a long game. <laughs> but 
he I was posting a bunch of stuff on social media about the mindset and growth and the mental aspect of something. I don't remember the exact post, but he's like, dude, you are pretty like minded to a bunch of our guys. Do you know what we do? And he opened my world to everything that I was already doing. Book clubs, men's mental health groups that I was leading just my tribe. I didn't have like minded people around. I would gather people around to play basketball, but that was for two hours once a week. And so when he said, hey, you literally do everything that we do. But by the way, you can make money doing it. I'm like, well, shit, it can't be that bad, can it? We just got to talk to strangers at the door. Being a bartender for six years, I talk to strangers, drunk chicks all the time. I have no <laughs> issue talking to people, which actually in hindsight, it helped me out a lot with talking to people. But so I went out there and just tried it, not really knowing Ty yet, not really knowing anybody else on the team, but I had nothing to lose. And I really, he pitched it as everything I was doing, I could do for money. And I was like, money, huh? That's an interesting concept I've never had before. <laughs> that so sounds like, kind of cool. Yeah, that's not what my driving factor, but I'll, I'll give it a shot because all these people, like-minded group, um, and I felt like I was going to be competitive at something that I choose to do. It doesn't matter what it was, but he just approached me with this and uh, got there, had no problem talking to people, was really eager to learn. So I wasn't scared of rejection. Um, all I wanted to do was just get out there and talk to people on the doors. And then I'll learn the Vivint stuff later. Then I, once I understood the craft and started getting good at it, I started forming relationships really quickly with our guys that we had in the team. I was like, holy shit, like we can really, really like build something special with the culture. And then now fast forward to today, my favorite part about this whole thing is building the culture. We have new rookies coming in. We have top golf tomorrow with a bunch of guys from KU, Northwest coming to be a part of what we're creating, which is my favorite part of this whole thing. It's legit. Yeah, it's powerful. It, it is. And it's, I think pulling people from all walks of life that it's into something that is built on a mindset, not a product. Oh yeah. Is that's thinking outside the box. And in today's world to win, you have to think outside the box. And it's, that's something I, I don't think most people understand how to even craft or even begin to craft. I think that we're so much on the same page, though, because we feel the same way towards that, that that's not really outside the box for us. It wasn't like product driven for me first. It was the connection of human beings first. And I think that's what it still is. So I, I understand what you're saying, but like the way we feel about this whole thing and why we're going to go to the moon is because the Vivint stuff is great. We need to teach people how to sell X's and O's, Y's of the product to stay here. But like that's not the real mission. But I'm saying it's outside the box in something that you can do it, that it's attached to money for to sure. grow the success. Yeah. That there's a lot of people that are doing these types of things. And like you said, you were already doing these things before. Yeah. But Ty's like, how about you do it and you make money? Yeah. yeah then yeah. you're like, sick. That sounds <laughs> sounds cool. Right. Like, how does it work? Mm -hmm. And then he goes into where it's on home security. You're like, come again? Like, how does that? What, you were, we were talking about book clubs and playing basketball <laughs> yeah. and doing all this. How, right. how do we get into selling security? Right. So it's like, it's cool that that's the byproduct of what you guys are building, that it, it all ties into one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I and mean, it's, it's crazy because if you're a part of our program, if you went to ask any of our reps right now and, and you ask like, hey, what do, you, what do you do for a living? They, they would literally go through and I would say probably 90% of them would go and say, hey, you know, we actually do, we run this like development program. And we talk about personal finance and we invest and we, and we do all these different things. And they'd be like, and, and, and we knock doors and sell Vivint. Like that might be like <laughs> maybe the last thing they say. And we've purposely crafted in that order of like what's most important. Because to us, it really is like, dude, we want to provide an opportunity that impacts vision, finances, health, camaraderie, relationships. <laughs> and we run this organization. We just fund it with the skill set of selling Vivint's world-class product. And there is a lot of fun there, but like the empire is built in, people catch on to, I want to go live that life. I want to be fulfilled. I want to be passionate. I want to have great relationships and friends, and I want to be in control. And everyone in my current world doesn't have that. And these guys are like 
dabbling on the on the on the edge of like pulling it off like what if i went and came and contributed and, and that's what's like so fun and special is like the door to door it's just like to us i, I kind of describe it to people I'm like that's like our accounting it has to be done it has to be done well or you're foobard but like our real business is is this other stuff and like this product that we sell for vivid it's just the necessary thing that you got to be skilled at to afford to be here and and the funny thing is probably 15 years ago you walk in with a whiteboard you put this all up they'd be like you lost your goddamn mind <laughs> Dude, you know Dude, what's crazy like, is get it out of here what's crazy is we Next. still still like we go to events sometimes and it's like you know i speak at a lot of event stuff and we'll, we'll have there's 150 teams like there's a there's a we're a, we're a small piece of the the vivant ecosystem it's, it's a 100 billion dollar company right it's huge and people will say like we've never heard anybody talk about it like this like there's literally people in Utah that like they're just like, dude, I just thought I was like, gonna get a good job and I want to make 200k and like that. That's like, pff, that's the lid for me, dude. Like that's as far as I can think. If I'm a manager, I make 400. I can make it to a regional one day. Maybe I'll make 700. I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't give a shit. Like, <laughs> like you're missing the whole mark. You have a chance to build an empire here and impact so many people's lives. Like, how do you not get this? And that's once again people view it from a money position yeah that it's like you go find that ceiling really fast there is nothing worse than having that ceiling like and it's <clears throat> something i've tried crafting within mmg which i need to even get better at crafting it is giving as much runway as someone wants and it's we've we've opened the doors to to selling and i probably need to be better at teaching that all the time which i'll take fault for that but it's in the car business. I came right out the gate, right out of college, and I was making great money. I had the house, I had the cars, I had all the things that most people think are making it. But I fucking hated my life. I was like, I live at work. I've figured out what my max pay is, and this is what they're saying my value is, is this dollar and cent that I'm gonna trade for the rest of my life. And the funny thing is you take most people that worked a third of the hours of, that I was working, and they would trade to have my job in a heartbeat every single day. And then three years down the road, they're gonna be like, this sucks. <laughs> and it's like, I thought I was gonna fight, like I thought the grass was gonna be way greener on the other side. I thought that I would get all this money and all of a sudden every problem I had in my life was fixed. And then, you know what? I had a great relationship with my wife and I got this job. Now we got problems all because I'm never home. And it's like, oh, I have kids and they never see me. It's like, you just created a whole new pool of problems. And it's like, so you look at that and I'm like, if, if I had kids and everything else and I was like standing at that, that crossroad of what the money I had in that life or money of if this path was I had the family, I, I had everyone else and it was a third of the money, I would have taken this one all day long. That because I look at my path ends in the car business and when I left, if I would have ended up on my deathbed I'm sitting at Liberty Hospital and I'm like, hey, you're not making it through the night. You know how pissed I've been at myself? Like, I would have been so mad that three years I never took mass in the lunch because I was at work all the time. That was like, I was so mad at myself for like wasting that time. And granted, it's all on perspective how you look at it. It gave me a lot of great relationships. It gave me a great skill set, things like that to progress into this. But now it's, I mean, Monday, I was sitting at the office. I'm like, grab the marketing guys. I'm like, you want to go have sushi? <laughs> right? Actually, it was on a Tuesday because we were supposed to do tacos. But I'm like, you want to go have sushi? And it's just like, I mean, if it's lunchtime and I want to go somewhere and then everyone get, goes out to lunch every day, we, it, I want people to enjoy working. That's sick. Working should be something that is fun. It should be something that is not a just miserable grind all the time. I've seen this stat. It's like, I don't know if you've ever looked at that, that chart, like how much, like what phase of your life you spend X amount of time with like your kids and your wife. And like, as you get older, those touches go down or whatever, but you spend most of your time with you with work, right? Like, especially if you're a male, like you're, you're probably going to spend the majority of your adult life with your coworkers. And like, how terrible is it if you're in an environment or you're in a position where you don't have good relationships and you're not stoked to go push a mission or a vision down the line and to me i think that's what's so fun about what you guys are building and you know the culture you guys have here i've been i've get to see it like i've been at 
ground level, man. And it's still a lot basement. of basement. Yeah. <laughs> Below. Below. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's sick. Cause you're, you're bringing in people that they'll never know that, you know, like they'll, they'll never see those days. Like there's a lot of people like outside of one of my reps, they'll never see the first year I managed how much of a freaking shit show it was and like how freaking dog tired I was doing everything. But that's, what's so fun about the whole process and just building something with people that you care about. Like that's what, uh, to me, that's just that, that's the fulfillment provide bigger opportunities for everyone in your org. And I, I look back on those days of being in the basement. I wish I would, I wish I would have enjoyed those days more. I look back and I like miss those days. I miss the days that we're all staying downstairs with our shirts off and stuff. Half the people are playing ping pong, we're playing COD, but we're working till midnight. <laughs> like it was so cool, like during that, that I told, I had a meeting this week with a group from the basement that I told them, I was like, I want to make sure you guys keep an eye on me that I don't lose focus of what this is. That I'm like, I I am very addictive. I have a very addictive personality that I, I want to grow this to where it's, I've been very integrated in the processes, the software that's put in place, all building it for scale. That I'm not playing one move ahead. I'm playing fucking 10 moves ahead. Like make sure that you're built for scale. And that's where so many people fail. But I told him, I was like, make sure I don't lose sight of what this is supposed to be. And it's fun for everyone to be here. Because the second it becomes not fun and it takes that away from everyone else, then I'm failing at what I'm doing. Yeah. That is a true failure at a leadership position that it's, I have to rely on those people around me to make sure that doesn't happen. That they check me all the time. That it's, I don't bury my head too deep and get in that just daily grind of that, that just rotation of X amount forward, X amount forward that it's, and I feel like you can get lost in it really quick. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting thing. You just mentioned, I definitely have learned so much in leadership because I, I would say like, that's my biggest role. Like I train and develop individuals, but, um, a, an epiphany I had, yeah, I don't remember what year, but just as I was managing and doing all this stuff and really to like grow and exit and have scale is leaders. It's, it's really not about being able to execute everything. It's just being able to orchestrate the execution of everything. Yeah. And that's such like a very like profound difference. And it's so like nuanced that people miss it. And it's just, you've got to be able to be a great GM You've got to put people, let them thrive, let them dominate and, and, you know, step out of the way. And then as well, like know who checks you. And like it's your leadership is to like the mission and the vision. And you, I've, I've erroneously done this where I've been like, if I'm a good enough leader, I can get this person to, to be here. I can get them to change. And, you know, Ryan, I had this talk the other day, like the, the thing that I've realized is my leadership loyalty isn't necessarily to each person but it's to that vision that we all subscribe to that they like consign to it and i have to protect that and so if someone's no longer fitting that like we have to lead the organization around the mission and the vision and find people let them attack it however they want but like if you're the leader you start to change the vision on people and change the path that's when you kind of like run into issues yeah and i feel like sometimes i've lacked on fully relaying that vision and keeping it front and center that it's something right now like i'm looking to have a whole drawing built to the fantasy factory that's going to live right above our whiteboard like i'm going to put <laughs> it on fucking paper of this is what it looks like that like type. it and it's like i will build and construct the whole thing but it's what do we do every single day to get there and sometimes when you're not relaying that vision all the time it may be something that's in your head so constant, but that doesn't mean everyone else is seeing it all the time. And they don't see that you're pushing towards that all the time. That it, it's, I can be out of the office having meetings all day, but it's not like I answer to anyone there saying like, hey, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. All they see is you out of the office and not going towards that vision. And it's like, I may be out networking with clients and it may be a client that is on the fence lately that I haven't got to show my face to. And it's like, Hey, do you want to go out to lunch? Like you want to go do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, those are things that have to happen, but it's, you have to work on that, that vision relaying down the line constantly. And it's like, 
if they start losing sight of that, that's a fault to you. And it, it's something I've I've had talked with a lot of the guys lately that I, I have failed at that, uh, bringing that to light all the time and re-emphasizing it day over day. That it's like it's if you want to go somewhere and you have no map, it's really hard to get there. Yeah, show them every single day that you have the map, and we're following the the path. Yeah, I had a a mentor. He used to work at Vivian, but I used to meet with him when I was first starting out, and he he broke it down. I think it's really good. I share it with the team all the time. You you've got to have a telescope and a microscope all the time. You got to have a telescope that sees the stars and the ultimate destination, how sexy and cool the galaxy is. But you got to have a microscope to know what's got to get done now. And you got to be able to like flip between the two and see that inspiring anchor point that's in the galaxy, the stars, like you just, the dream. But you've got to be able to hone in and attack like that piece of work that's got to get done and know how they correlate. And I think it's just so true. Like it's easy to go like full dream mode or it's easy to go like full task mode. Yeah. But it's a, it's a real like, the, the magic happens when you've got both going. It, and I'm, I'm going to say that's a, a talent in its own. Yeah, it's a skill. To be able to run those one, one and another together all the time. Because it's really easy when you, you, you focus on that, that far out dream, the stars, and it's like, to me, I've, I've told people like, it's always just been so clear. Like I know how to get there. Like I just reverse engineer all the way back to what has to be done today. But then you end up with that microscope to try, this is what has to be done today for us to get there. And then it's like, you go into a month of just, Hey, this is what has to be done today. This is what has to be done today. Then we're like, where the fuck are we going? <laughs> like for, I see it. And I, yeah. uh, for but, me. So yours is the fantasy factory. For me, it's kind of different and it resonates with me different when I hang around Ty and when I'm after like <clears throat> hanging out with him, doing whatever, but it's how he lives his life or how I'm living my life. So it's not a physical, tangible thing, but like we talked about the freedom before, it's almost like we already have it. It's done. We already have it. And every waking moment of every day, we're acting like we've already had it, which in return, attracts it to us but other people see that other people feel that so if you already have it and it's kind of the abundance thing you already have it so just keep on doing what you're doing being in the present moment taking step by step in the direction that you want to achieve whatever is in the future is whatever but people feel that now so when they're around sitting at the table or when they're around watching the presentation of somebody given their training for the day they feel that and so when you're immersed in that every day, the summer is super powerful because everybody's with everybody. But it's something like, at least for me, and it's different for everybody, but what I want to be able to do is like every waking moment attract like-minded people to exist a certain way, not necessarily find an end goal or something. So I think cool. on that, where I put that tangible item out there, uh -huh. that fantasy factory is making a mark on something that's so much bigger. Like how it, it isn't the actual like item itself. Like if you, if I went out and I built it today and I just had it by myself and I'm like sitting in there, I'm like, well, this, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this sucks. Like no one's here. Like I, I picture like everyone that is in MMG now and all these other people that we have this state of the art gym that's there. We have this, this whole facility that is built an empire that it's changed if we get to that point, it's changed everyone's lives. hundred percent. Yeah. It stands for so much more than just a physical building. And I said, if there, and I'm going to retract that statement, I'm going <laughs> to say when, <laughs> when we get there, it's changed everyone's lives that are there. And yeah. it's like, I feel that is the purpose of it, that the building 100%. itself, like when we moved out of the basement, I, I remember we got the office down the river market and I'm, we're sitting in there. I remember sitting up top and everyone's down there and everyone's like looking at where they want to put desks and everything. And I was like, this is fucking cool. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, these people believed in me in a basement that every single person that worked in the basement and they're like, yeah, we're going to work for this dude in his basement. And I'm like, it sounds fucking crazy. hundred percent. Like I'm not discounting that, but it's like, then all of a sudden it came to fruition of being in the office. And I was like, this gives these people legitimate workplace. Oh yeah. Now 
the way that people look at them is different. Now. Mm-hmm. It's not like, hey, I'm working for some dude in his basement. It's they were proud to say where they were at. It, they were proud. For like, sure. I see in the early days where everyone's bringing people to the office to show them this place that's now ours. Like, And then I look at the next step where it's like when the fantasy factory is built and it's like this mecca of a, a, a hub that it's it brings so much more. It brings new talent and it brings more people into the, the culture. It brings more people that a building in a space like I look at what first forms done with their headquarters out in St. Louis. That changed what that was. That changed first form forever. That was their mark on what the gold fucking standard is. Yeah. It's like a physical representation of the journey that you've been on. Yeah. Which is exactly the same. Yeah. I think it's, I feel that for sure. So what, what were you mumbling over there, Dre? Are we about to die out on cameras? No, I already replaced everything. I pulled the photo. The first day we were uh-huh. in. <laughs> Let's go. I pulled yeah. that. I, I don't think I've seen the space that I haven't in a very long time. No, but it, it was like, that was a monumental step. That that was like yeah. the step that so solidified the company. And it's, I want to build something that the people within are so proud to be a part of. That's something MMG like in the beginning was me and then now it's progressed into being something bigger than me. And that's like, that's what I was so excited for was the, when it started taking its own course that people know MMG, people know people inside of it. And it's like, everyone's taken on their personalities inside the the company and they're, they've started to grow. And it's like, we've talked about, we're going to start a lot more podcasts that like with people in the company that they're going to start their own podcast that they run within MMG that it's like, uh, I look at what Barstool has done and it's like, we want to mimic the same thing. It's really we, good. And we, it's, they have absolutely killed it at getting people's attention. And it's, we're going to do the same thing. There's so many things that are going to come out in 24 that we've upped our, <coughs> our posting count. Like we're taking on so many different things to like elevate that much higher. That it's so it's I, I look at the fantasy factory is what they all bought into, what that vision is, what that step looks like, and it is not fair to them if I didn't make that happen. To where it's like that's a hundred percent what I think about is like how fast can we make that happen? And like I put I was talking with Dre, I'm like, I'm doing all the math. And I'm like, dude, we get these accounts, we get these accounts. I have it like all broken down. I'm like, end of 2024, we can do it. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, if we put all this in place, like if we're doing this culture stuff, it's gonna drive these people to come in. I was like, we get these people. I'm like, once again, it looks like a jumbled mess. But in my head, it's very clear. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like those things that you you get to that step and that, that that's what's going to elevate everyone yeah but very very thankful for you guys coming on this is definitely gonna be a two-part podcast i know we got cameras going down everywhere we got <laughs> the the whole nine very much like our new mics too I, they I, sound yeah, great they, Amazing. I, very, I like them we have to get some more for the office for tyler's podcast yeah update me mm-hmm. do what i'm not i'm not gonna say that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <coughs> we will uh tag tyler's podcast the money game below um definitely you'll give it a listen uh ryan gave a whole backstory in that one so um yeah that'd be that'd be a cool part too that if it's a you're, cool episode yeah. yes tyler, tyler drops badass episodes all the time dude you get <laughs> crazy people on and absolutely kill it but we were talking Appreciate tonight it. that we probably just needed to open the podcast and just say hey what's up this is Tyler ryan and then just sit back and let you guys <laughs> kill it so um you guys are killing in the space I, I mean like i said tyler's the the only person been on three podcasts now dude i love it i it's funny i tell sarah every time she's like why are you going so early i'm like i want to hang out with my guys okay <laughs> <laughs> i just want to see them like, no. so I'm, I'm grateful for you guys and I, I love what you guys do. And it's, it's freaking cool to see what you guys are doing. 
And I appreciate it. Ryan, what all do you have going on as far as like socials? Where can people find you? Um, just on Instagram, like I mentioned before. I, I mentioned on your podcast, I'm banned from Twitter. Oh, whoa. <laughs> yeah. is that a thing? I, yeah. Him and Trump, bro. Yeah. Dude, you you are an elite a, group. There's only <laughs> two <laughs> only two people on the planet, and I Me think you're one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Now that it's X, I don't know what the rule is there. But uh, yeah, Instagram. My last name's crazy to to spell, but it's Ryan Mogdrosh. Um, we'll put we'll link that too. We'll, yeah, we'll definitely link <laughs> that. yeah, that's mainly where I put my stuff. Cool, cool. Well, like I said, you dudes are are on it, and there's definitely going to be future podcasts because you guys are going to continue to get bigger and bigger oh, yeah. and bigger, and we're going to be here to document the the growth right here. One day we're going to do it from our. From our, well, our, our, we're gonna our, put it on skywalk. the catwalk across the, <laughs> yeah. on the hanger, yeah. Yeah. The hanger. <laughs> over the catwalk. We'll uh, there'll be a podcast there one day. Mark my words. So, uh, any final thoughts down there, Ricky? No, really enjoyed having you guys on. So, that is the M3 podcast, and we're gonna key Dre. Thanks for listening to the M3 podcast. The M3 podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Want to learn more? Check us out on Instagram at Moss Marketing Group, on Facebook at Moss Marketing 58, or on our website at mossmarketinggroup.com.